is one o'clock, a point in time to begin our council uh, meeting this afternoon. And I will welcome everyone to again, this virtual meeting of council for May 31st, 2021. Welcome to council, all in attendance here with the exception of uh, Councillor Bartley and we expect him to join us momentarily as soon as his uh, technical difficulties have subsided. Staff are with us and our listening um, public as well. So welcome to all. I will uh, begin this meeting this afternoon and ask you to join me in a moment of reflection. Thank you. Is there any uh, disclosure of interest in any of the agenda items uh, for discussion today? Noting that uh, if one, a need arises at any time, you may so declare at that time. And uh, with that, we will move into announcements. Um, and the first one that uh, I am pleased to, to note, uh, although it is such a, a sad, sad story, um, the flags uh, uh, in the municipality as across the county will be lowered um, at the Market Square flagpoles today in remembrance of the 215 Indigenous children uh, discovered on the grounds at the Kamloops Indian Residential School at Kamloops Te Sequa Pemp Territory. The flags will remain at, uh, lowered for 215 hours representing one hour for each child lost as a reminder of the continuing work to be done towards truth and reconciliation. Another uh, announcement I have is uh, the Georgian Triangle Humane Society is going to be at the uh, fire hall from four to 6 p.m. this afternoon, offering low cost services to Meaford residents who have booked um, rabies and a microchip uh, clinic. Um, this is a, 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 a low cost service uh, to our residents and I would really like to thank the Georgian Triangle Humane Society for the work that they do to support and find homes for our four legged members of our community and uh, to uh, encourage folks to take advantage of these clinics when they do come forward for us. Um, we also have an announcement today about uh, um, a partnership with the Green Stream Lawn and Vegetation Management to stop the spread of invasive weeds along rural roadways in our municipality. Beginning this week, Truvist herbicide will be applied in overgrown and weedy areas, but not manicured lawns along various road sections. Weather permitting, the word is a word. Work is, to, is anticipated to take about two days to complete. Truvist is shown to be effective in targeted control of wild chervil, as well as a number of other invasive weed species. Again, um, there are more information included, uh, frequently asked questions on our vegetation management program, um, or for a full list of locations, visit mefor.ca slash vegetation. And the last uh, announcement I have today is about a road closure. Um, we are advising that the 8th Concession South road closure from Holland, Sydenham Town Line and Sunny Valley Road has been extended from May the 25th to June the 4th for the replacement of culverts and road construction. The road will be fully closed from 9 to 5 each day and fully open at night. Uh, nearby residents, of course, will may experience increased noise and dust while the work is completed. And that was all I had for announcements. Is, uh, the, are there any other announcements from folks around the table? Um, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, a couple, if I may, and because I have... Uh, inquired uh, recently about uh, a new sign at the end of Nelson Street in the uh, bed. I'm very uh, happy and, and uh, thankful that uh, we we're able to acknowledge staff today for getting that sign replaced, a new welcome to Meaford Harbour sign, and it looks great. 
Um, and just around the corner from that at the uh, pavilion at the entrance to the Georgian Trail, there's a beautiful bed and I wanted to acknowledge and thank Transition Meaford for the uh, Bee and Butterfly Garden. It's, uh, it's, it's a really beautiful little garden and I'm sure will uh, serve its purpose well in, in attracting bees and butterflies. Um, and also wanted uh, to acknowledge, and those on the committee may want to add, uh, the, uh, May the 30th until June 5th is uh, National Accessibility Week and, and a great opportunity to raise awareness for all that's been accomplished by our wonderful Accessibility Committee and uh, just uh, to thank them for the great work that they have done uh, this past year and always. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Good news. Anything else? And I see he, Councillor Bartley has joined us. Welcome, Steve. At uh, this stage, then, we move into public, uh, public participation. And we certainly welcome uh, the, our listening public to uh, come and join us uh, virtually for now, of course, um, with comments, questions on agenda items or deputations or presentations. Um, we ask, though, that uh, anyone interested in uh, appearing before Council uh, that you get in touch with the clerk's office before 10 on the morning of the council meeting so that uh, your, um, your wishes can be, can be forwarded and so that uh, we can hear from you um, over the course of the, uh, of the meeting. Um, we also encourage folks to uh, tune in on Meaford's YouTube channel at meaford.ca slash YouTube. Uh, to uh, lives where the live stream version of the council meeting will be shown. And we welcome, of course, as usual, Rogers TV uh, that is filming the procedures. So with that, uh, we'll move into presentations and we have two this afternoon. The first one is Heritage Barnes and I will welcome Wesley Wilson to uh, give his presentation. Hi. Hi. Welcome. I'll just uh, give it a minute for the presentation slides to be brought up onto the screen. All right, perfect. Well, thank you, everyone. And uh, hello, all. I'd like to start by thanking the mayor, deputy mayor, and council for allowing me the opportunity to speak before you all today. My name is Wes Wilson. And before I begin, I'd like to take a brief moment to tell you a bit about myself. I live in Norfolk County where I'm a descendant of the founding UEL families, where my family has farmed for over 200 years, conserving the original barn that was constructed on the lands granted to our family. I'm actively involved in several professional committees, including the International Scientific Committees for the International Committee on Monuments and Sites through the United Nations, Architectural Conservancy of Ontario, ASHRAE, Canadian Society for Civil Engineering, along with the Norfolk Historical Society. And recently I finished my degree in architectural conservation and sustainability engineering. I'm here before you all today representing Ontario Barn Preservation, which I'm the District 12 representative, along with the policy and advocacy functions of the organization being part of my portfolio. As part of this, we are making a series of deputations to engage the municipal councils across the province to advocate for the change of surplus farm dwelling severance policy to avoid the unnecessary demolition of rural agricultural structures. Next slide, please. Ontario Barn Preservation is a not-for-profit started in 2019 to advocate for our heritage barns. We do not advocate for mandatory preservation, but encourage voluntary preservation, reuse, and restoration where possible, and provide the resources to those who are interested in doing this. You can check out all of our initiatives at ontariobarnpreservation.com. Next slide, please. The provincial policy statement on heritage barns is that uh, significant built heritage resources uh, and significant cultural heritage resources shall be conserved. Uh, we believe that uh, preserving barns is an important part of this goal. Next slide, please. Although heritage barns may not have the same functionality they once did, we believe that they are an important part of Ontario's cultural history and rural landscape. They provide landmarks in the countryside for our rural scenery. They have the potential to be reused and repurposed. They are value-added opportunities for agritourism, 
And along with this, the reuse of existing buildings is more environmentally friendly than the use of native new buildings. In addition to those, they have historic value for research and vernacular architecture along with cultural heritage. They convey an important sentiment to urban counterparts about the hardworking farm community. They're in addition useful for uh, small farm operations and they contribute to the rural economic growth and development of rural areas. Next slide, please. <coughs> Recently, we became aware that the surplus farm dwelling severance policy was causing the unnecessary demolition of heritage barns. Research with municipalities, planners, architects, and engineers. Uh, some of the key policy attributes from the provincial policy statement, OMAFRA, zoning regulations, official plans, and the Ontario Building Code regulations, which are creating difficulties in the conservation of barns. Next slide, please. The first policy item that we felt was most detrimental to uh, heritage barns was the minimum distance separation requirements. And uh, the best uh, way to tackle this is to ensure that the barn is retained on the farmhouse lot was the best solution. When done this way, the barn is already in compliance with the minimum distance regulations. Most owners of these small farms see them as a novel asset rather than an obsolete liability. These small farm owners are also interested in hobby farming, adaptive reuse, preservation, starter farms, CSAs, farm gates, and estate residential. We feel that barns served on the, are severed on the retained farmhouse lot have the greatest chance of success and preservation. Next slide, please. Where a barn is retained on the agricultural lot, being the larger piece, it is in immediate violation of the minimum distance separation requirements. And uh, because the farmhouse is on the separate piece of property. And due to this unsuitability via the minimum distance separation requirements, um, these barns um, uh, almost guarantee its demise. And in addition to that, uh, due to the unsuitability of the barns to house animals or uh, equipment effectively, most farm owners would tear it down from a lack of interest in preservation. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Some of the solutions we found to this problem were retaining the barn on the farmhouse lot as said prior with limits on animal capacity or areas uh, zoning that state that lots must comply with OMAFRA manure management guidelines and <clears throat> or retaining the barn on the farmer's lot and making it unreasonably capable of housing animals. Next slide, please. The next policy that we felt was most detrimental to heritage barns comes from the provincial policy statement, which states that a new lot will be limited to a minimum size needed to accommodate the use and appropriate sewage and water services. This small lot and restrictive guidelines almost always results in the barn being retained on the large agricultural lot and as explained prior, guarantees its demise. Some solutions we found uh, from other municipalities across the province were using a minimum and maximum lot size rather than the above stricter guidelines. They were reviewing each severance on a case by case basis to determine the best collection of buildings. And they provided language to consider heritage structures, landscape features, and other site assessments for the severance built within their policies. Some municipalities also did a reasonable use assessment to ensure that the lot was adequately sized for future septic systems. Next slide, please. The next policy item that we found challenging was the designation of non-farm use. We feel that non-farm designation of a small residential lot creates a conflict of use in prime agricultural lands and encourages non-farm residents to purchase these properties that can lead to neighbor conflicts. Where farm use, including livestock, are permitted on these small plots. It encourages farming uh, owners, barn reuse, startup C uh, CSAs, and more that contribute to rural revitalization, as well as a better chance of success for these structures. Next slide, please. The last policy item we found challenging was the mandatory change of use for buildings to not permit livestock, where a barn needs to be proven not to be used for livestock housing. Uh, OMAFRA distinguishes a building capable of housing animals um, as one with water and stalls. 
By removing these items from a heritage barn, it can be proved uh, to be an accessory or shed building rather than a livestock housing, exempting it from the minimum distance separation requirements and nutrient management plans. Note that the Ontario Building Code actually does not distinguish the difference between an agricultural shed building and an agricultural livestock building. <clears throat> it only distinguishes between agriculture building, a part nine small building, or part three large building, doing a mandatory change of use from agricultural into these other categories. Um, part nine or part three are usually financially challenging and not feasible for most barn owners. <clears throat> we would suggest that wording be clear in zoning bylaws and not left open to interpretation. Next slide, please. I'd like to leave you with this quote. It is possible that millions now living in North America have never seen a barn, let alone been in one. In the foreseeable future, there is more than a possibility that for many, the kind of barn illustrated in these uh, slides uh, will not be there to be seen. Too often we see these historic structures in poor condition with loose boards flapping in the wind, roofs caved in, or just the massive timbers decaying into the ground. We realize that not all barns can be saved. But on behalf of Ontario Barn Preservation, we encourage you to help find ways to uh, prevent the further unnecessary demolition of these heritage structures, especially in relation to surplus farm building severances. It is our hope that barns of significant cultural heritage value are conserved for future generations. I'd like to thank you for your time today. Uh, and if you have any questions on anything that was presented, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you, Wes. Very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, is there any question that uh, Councillor Kentner has a question for you? Uh, thank you, through your worship. It, it isn't so much a question as just a, a statement, and that is that uh, in the municipality of Meaford, your uh, Heritage Advisory uh, Committee is uh, restricted to a very small uh, segment of downtown urban Meaford. And it's to be hoped that uh, a presentation like uh, this from uh, uh, Mr. Wilson today uh, will uh, enlighten us to uh, broaden the scope of the Heritage Committee going forward and enable us to uh, do a little more work to preserve uh, the many great assets, uh, heritage assets we have uh, through rural Meaford as well as urban Meaford. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kentner. Well, with that, I will thank you. Oh, sorry, we have another question, Councillor Greenfield. Thank you, uh, you worship, and thanks, uh, thanks to Mr. Uh, Wilson. Uh, I found that a very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, there are some uh, amazing uh, structures. Uh, in our municipality, uh, many of them 150 years old. Uh, most of them uh, never never saw an, an electric tool or a battery powered tool when they were built. Uh, there were axes, there were adds, there were uh, sometimes wooden hammers. Uh, and quite often, the vast majority of the community involved in erecting them. I, uh, I always feel a, a measure of sadness when I pass by, whether it be on the highway or a back road or wherever and, uh, and see a rural barn becoming derelict, uh, basically falling down or indeed having fallen down. They are an important part of our heritage. And I, I just wanna throw in, uh, We've heard quite a bit of discussion about height of buildings lately. Most barns, 150 years old, were well over 50 feet high. Uh, so uh, uh, having high buildings in our municipality is not something new. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Greenfield. Thanks so much. And uh, uh, Deputy Mayor and then uh, Councilor Vickers. Thank you, Your Worship, and I just wanted to thank Mr. Wilson and to let him know that we will be reviewing our uh, official plan um, this year, and so your presentation is, is really timely as we look at those zoning opportunities and to also let you know that we have a wonderful barn in Meaford that has been repurposed and is now a destination for weddings at, uh, at Grandma Lamb's, so I thought you'd uh, like to know that. Thank you. 
and Councillor Vickers. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Mr. Wilson, are, are you ever afraid that that this bylaw, if we, if not bylaw, if this change was made about including uh, the barn being included into the, the severed house, that actually creates more like a larger lot. It would almost be like an estate lot. And do you ever feel that, uh, that it might be taken advantage of to get a, a larger lot uh, severed off and then in the end, somebody come along and tear down the barn anyway and then just have like a, a five acre lot or a 10 acre uh, lot as compared to a, a one or two acre lot. Uh, because I think usually when these uh, severances do go through, they're probably limited pretty close to an acre, uh, I think. Um, so it, do you ever worry, I, I understand your, what's driving you, but do you ever worry that somebody will just use this as a, as a way to get you know, larger estate lots more or less made? Uh, as opposed to a, a one acre lot. From what I have found, and thank you for the question, through the mayor to councillor, um, from what I have found, that typically has not been the case. I understand exactly where you're coming from and the logic in that regard. Um, it is a risk, as is any risk with a severance, and that uh, comes down to the planner's judgment at the same time because when the planner is putting through the severance, they have the leeway and the ability to restrict the lot sizing in the planning process to allow certain portions of the lot to be included and exclude other portions of the lot. So it could be through the planning process that very well could be prevented through the different uh, tools that uh, your planners have at their disposal because the barn can be included, but uh, an additional part of the lot could also be excluded um, to keep it uh, within the regulations to prevent exactly what you're saying from occurring. Um, but yes, that is absolutely a risk um, from occurring, especially near urban centers. Um, but as I said prior, that comes down to the planner's judgment in their professional opinion, working with the client to, or sorry, with the resident of the municipality to determine the best outcome as well. Thank you for that. Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Madam Mayor and uh, Mr. Wilson. Um, I have taken part in refurbishing the odd barn. Um, what if any financial help would be available? Cause it is expensive. It is expensive and it's not cheap. I know that from experience. Um, most times financial incentives, uh, so say if you're doing a uh, economic, uh, or sorry, a, a business in a barn and uh, you're wanting to refurbish, there are opportunities uh, for municipalities to offer economic grants to uh, different residents uh, for uh, refurbishment and enhancements. Also through the Ontario Heritage Act, there is tools for the municipality to offer uh, tax incentives for different owners who are uh, owners of heritage properties. Um, in addition, there are, um, if you, local chambers of commerce can access grant systems through uh, the province to aid these businesses. And in addition to that, there are a variety of other tools uh, through grants and funding streams through the Ministry of Sport, Tourism, Heritage and Cultural Industries, uh, where you can access different grant streams. Um, typically, I've found that these grant streams are not readily obvious. Uh, so in most instances, you have to do a bit of digging and legwork to find the ones that you want. Uh, but there are some there and uh, in addition, some municipalities have built their own grant systems uh, to aid uh, uh, barn owners and heritage structure owners uh, to aid in that costly expense of a renovation like you were just saying. But also at the same time, through the uh, recommendations um, and different policy attributes that I've described today, it lessens the cost on the homeowner, uh, or sorry, on the barn owner because then those regulatory uh, components that are fiscally challenging aren't um, in place to constrict an owner from doing a change of use for these agricultural buildings as well. 
Thank you so much, uh, Wes. I have to move on now, but we really Thank appreciate you. the time that you've shared with us today. And Thank good you. Luck the project. Thank you. Moving on now to the transportation master plan presentation, uh, something we've all been waiting for for quite some time. I want to welcome Scott Johnson for his presentation. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, your worship and thank you for having me today I'm very pleased to meet you deputy mayor and council uh, can everyone hear me yes we're fine go ahead please thank thank you okay i'll start by thanking you for the opportunity to speak about the transportation master plan this is a very important project that we've been working on for approximately the past 18 months my name is scott johnston i'm the project manager for ibi group i'm a professional engineer and i've been working on similar plans for the past 18 years IBI Group are the consultant hired by Meaford to prepare the transportation master plan. And we've been working very closely with staff, the public and stakeholders on this plan. I believe the draft report has been shared with you for your review and comment. And today I'm here to give you an overview of the plan. Next slide. This is the agenda for today. I'll talk about the purpose of the transportation master plan, the recommendations, of the plan and cost and affordability. Uh, the focus here is on key recommendations and there are additional details in the plan and the supporting appendices. Next slide. With that, we'll get started with the purpose of the transportation master plan. Next slide. Okay, so what is the transportation master plan? It is a plan that guides investment in transportation infrastructure and provides policies and guidelines. It's important to note that it is a plan and not a commitment. Projects that are recommended will be brought to council for separate approvals. It is a plan that identifies and responds to Meaford's transportation needs. It recommends investment in rural and urban roads and active transportation which is walking and cycling, while balancing costs and benefits of those recommendations. And it recommends a series of policies to help Meaford manage the transportation system and respond to new and ongoing needs. Next slide. An important part of a transportation master plan is to develop a vision statement. Uh, it allows us to focus on what is relevant to Meaford and make sure the plan reflects the local context. The vision statement we developed is the municipality of Meaford will provide a sustainable, connected, and economical multimodal transportation system where goods and agricultural equipment are moved efficiently and people of all ages and abilities can travel safely. Next slide. Along with the plan, we developed, along with the vision statement, we developed four goals of the transportation master plan. These goals help guide the development of recommendations and the evaluation of alternatives. Goal number one is to meet the transportation needs of present and future urban and rural residents and businesses, be delivered and maintained in a fiscally responsible and sustainable manner, enhance safety accessibility, equity, and inclusivity to support active, healthy lifestyles and livable communities and support environmental sustainability and climate change objectives. Next slide. We held the first round of public and stakeholder feedback in May and June of 2020. The first round was to bring the vision and principles to the public and gather input on needs, issues, and opportunities. We held an online survey, which received over 300 responses, which we consider a great uh, amount of feedback. And we held a stakeholder meeting on June 10th, 2020, which included participation from agencies and groups within Meaford and adjacent municipalities, as well as Gray County. Some of the key input that we heard in this first round of consultation included traffic operations questions and comments such as difficulty turning onto Sykes Street. 
we heard about Miller Street, east of County Road 12, uh, about concerns there about speeding and safety for pedestrians. Uh, we heard quite a bit of requests for traffic calming measures on urban roads. We also heard about road repairs and how they should be prioritized and how they should emphasize roads that are most used, used and experience the highest traffic volumes. And we heard support for new sidewalks and cycling infrastructure. Next slide. Taking what we heard from the public and stakeholders, we developed a summary of the needs and opportunities for the transportation master plan. These key needs are accommodating growth, supporting agriculture, a better approach to traffic calming, safety for all road users, filling gaps in the sidewalk network, enabling cycling as a daily activity, supporting regional transit initiatives, prioritizing bridge and structure renewal, and ensuring maintenance needs are met. Next slide. So taking for bringing forward all of the issues, needs, and opportunities that we heard and gathered, we developed the broad directions for the transportation master plan. Uh, as a side note, the plan follows the municipal class environmental assessment for master plans. The EA process requires you, us to look at broad alternatives, and we looked at four alternatives, including maintain existing infrastructure, improving roads, focusing on active transportation, and a combined approach. These alternatives were evaluated against the goals and the vision and the combined approach was chosen as it integrates the best projects from the other alternatives. Next slide. And then we're moving into the recommendations of the TNP. Next slide. So the recommendations were developed in draft form and they were brought to the public and stakeholders in the second round of consultation. This included an online virtual public information center, which was held in January of 2021, and another online survey. We also held a stakeholder meeting with the same agencies and stakeholders uh, in January of 2021. These meetings allowed us to gather input on the recommendations and to tailor them for the final plan. Some of the key feedback we heard that has been incorporated into the plan is a need for more recognition of rural goods movement on local roads, support of traffic calming, sidewalk info, and the safety program. And we heard more concerns about the Miller Street project. Next slide. I'll walk through the recommendations of the rural and urban roads and the policies that were developed, starting with rural roads. So this slide shows uh, the rural road recommendations. Project one was to complete a proposed paved loop by paving and upgrading side road eight and concession road two. Project number two is intersection maintenance at side road 22 and concession road six, concession six. Projects three and seven are longer term projects that identifies four side road and seventh line as a future east west corridor. This was developed as we heard a concern about shortcutting trucks and traffic, but existing roads don't work for that traffic as County Road 40 is out of the way and puts traffic through Walters Falls and Bogmore. The roads in yellow are collector roads, which are recommended to be upgraded over time to better support goods. The TMP also recommends setting aside some budget for upgrading and maintaining rural roads serving agricultural goods over time. Next slide. A number of recommendations were developed for urban roads. Project eight is a recommendation for a more detailed study of Sykes Street in the downtown. This would include looking at safety, traffic operations, traffic signals, and parking. Project nine is Miller Street where we identified a potential to convert it to a cul-de-sac to help address shortcutting traffic. 
It requires further study before it is implemented. Project 10 is Pearson Street and Ridge Road, which need pedestrian and cycling facilities, traffic calming, and other changes. Project 11 is a county road intersection, Sykes Street and St. Vincent Street. And it was identified as needing further study as it has awkward geometries, high traffic volumes, difficult sight lines, and safety concerns. Next slide. Project 12 is the intersection of Sykes Street and Ford Avenue, which has a very shallow skew angle between the two roads, and it was recommended for a safety assessment. Project 13 is a larger parking study for Meaford to look at the supply and demand of parking in the downtown and, and the bylaw parking rates for the municipality overall. Projects 14 and 15 are proposed traffic calming roads, Aiken Street, Grant Ave and Grandview. In the urban Meaford, we also recommended uh, classifying uh, a couple of roads as collector roads as they would help up prioritize improvements to active transportation and traffic operations. Next slide. A really important part of the transportation master plan and a big concern that we heard from the public and stakeholders is safety. The TMP recommends a road safety program. This would have a number of action items. Staff would collect and review collision data from OPP annually. Looking at that data, they would identify intersections and roads where there are the most collisions. Depending on the review, staff could take action to mitigate issues according to the policies and guidelines of the TMP. Another part of this road safety program is for Meaford to consider a 40 kilometer per hour default speed limit in the urban area. The TMP recommend developed a new traffic calming policy and the TMP, the road safety program would follow the new traffic calming policy. The policy as an aside is to look at the need and warrant for traffic calming start with soft measures such as signage and information, and if needed through review, proceed to physical traffic calming measures. If capital budget is needed based on the road safety program and the, and the study of intersection locations or problem locations, capital budget would be scheduled into the road improvement program. And the road safety program recommends reporting to council on an annual basis. Next slide. We had a look at the bridges across Meaford. The TMP acknowledges the challenges faced in maintaining bridges. We developed a proposed prioritization approach or framework that determines which bridges get replaced or maintained first based on risk. The TMP also recognizes that some bridges may need to be closed and it proposes criteria for doing so. Criteria would include the availability of a detour, suitability of detour for heavy vehicles and agricultural equipment and impacts to residents and businesses. There is also a follow-up report providing additional analysis of bridges considered for closure. Next slide. The TMP developed a series of road policies and guidelines for staff to follow to manage the transportation network. This includes a road classification system, which distinguishes between urban and rural designations. We developed a new collector road designation, which I mentioned earlier, which and identified which collector roads may need to be upgraded over the long term. Another note on speed limits is that the municipality should follow the Transportation Association of Canada guidelines to establishing speed limits. And that reviews can be undertaken for existing roads where data suggests speeding. The TMP also developed road 
resurfacing guides, building on prior work, uh, which will base resurfacing on traffic data, network connectivity, agricultural needs, and maintenance and drainage needs. So resurfacing is not only based on traffic data, but also those other needs. Next slide. The TMP had a close look at pedestrian infrastructure. We developed a priority list of approximately 5.3 kilometers of sidewalks in urban Meaford that are recommended to be constructed over the next 10 years. These are locations where there are notable gaps in the existing network and where expanding and providing sidewalks would have the largest impact on safety and accessibility for the surrounding neighborhoods. We also identified six pedestrian crossover locations in Meaford. These are great recommendations because they're relatively low cost and can show a significant improvement in safety and walkability, addressing the concern about crossing Sykes Street that we heard. Next slide. We also had a close look at cycling in Meaford. We developed new cycling routes um, and they were identified to complement the Gray County cycling network and improve options for cyclists. Thank you, next slide. So that was a lot of information and a lot of recommendations and guides. Um, we have just one slide on cost and affordability before we wrap up. Next slide. We looked at the cost of all of the recommendations and note that the planning horizon of the TMP is out to 2045. We developed recommendations for the short term to 2025, medium term, 2026 to 2030, and long term from 2031 to 2045. Looking at the short term, the recommendations of the plan for the first, until 2025, the first four years, would require an annual budget of approximately 346,000. This rec represents a 2.4% increase in the tax supported budget. Between 2026 and 2030, some of the bigger projects are located in that time frame, and the timing of those projects may need to be shifted because some of those projects would depend on funding from other levels of government. The TMP provides need and justification and basis for municipality to apply for funding grants. There's a good uh, a good example of a new funding grant is the Canada National Active Transportation Strategy, which is proposing, I believe, $400 million for active transportation projects across Canada. There are other provincial grants uh, available and that uh, appear uh, over the years. Next slide. So in summary, I believe we've developed a great transportation master plan for Meaford. We had a lot of public interest, we heard a lot of concerns, and we identified many needs and issues. Um, while Meaford is small, there are some pretty significant issues for transportation, but fortunately, we were able to identify affordable solutions and policies that can make a real difference in the short term. The next steps for the TMP are following your review, we will enter the study into the statutory 30-day public review period. Following that, we will finalize the TMP, and I believe it will return to council for endorsement. Next slide. Thank you, Madam Mayor and council. I would be pleased to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Scott. That, uh a very, very thorough um, presentation and plan that uh, certainly covered uh, the highlights of uh, the, <clears throat> the challenges that we have been hearing um, several times now for uh, some really problematic areas in our community. And I'll just ask Council quickly if they have any questions for Scott at this point, knowing that uh, there will be more after the 30-day uh, consultation period. Councillor Bartley, you're first. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Mayor, and to Scott. I do realize the transportation master plan is, is a, a document for information purposes only, 
and anything we do going forward would have to come back through council. I do realize that. Having said that, I attended the uh, public meeting on January 20th. And let me say in the six years as a councillor, I've never been up that upset with a meeting in all my life. I was not allowed to speak. I was not allowed to give my point of view. And it was very clear to me that you and Zach that was heading the meeting are cyclists and the whole meeting was on cycling. And uh, it, it quite upset me. Now, going forward, I know what will come to council. I have no intentions of putting a cul-de-sac at Miller Street as long as I'm in this chair. I have no intentions of paving more roads down concession to or any other road until we can keep the roads we have in place now. I have no intentions of putting paved shoulders as long as we're still talking about closing bridges. I just wanted to put that forward before this goes much further. Thank you. Councillor Bartley. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Deputy, you're on mute, Shirley. Oh, I'm, I apologize, Your Worship. I thought I'd hit it. Um, thank you, Mr. Johnson, for your very, very comprehensive uh, plan. 475 pages is, is a lot of reading. So my first comment um, would be to ask for uh, Council's consideration for an extension on the 30-day comment period. I feel this is a really, really important plan for our residents. And it is, uh, as I say, a lot of reading. And I feel that uh, 30 days perhaps just isn't enough. And I would suggest uh, perhaps we add another month until our uh, second meeting in July, the 26th of July. Um, we've been working on this for 18 months and this is a, a plan for uh, many years to come, 25 years to come. So I think it's important that we give residents um, an ample chance to comment. Um, Your Worship, I had two other questions. I don't know if you want me to carry on or come back to me. Um, we just have Councillor uh, Greenfield is next, um, then I'll come back to you, Councillor. Uh, thank you. Harley, you're on mute. Yes. How's that? How's that? That's better. Thank you, uh, thank you Your Worship. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Johnson. and. Uh, through you, Your Worship, to uh, Mr. Johnson. First of all, thanks, uh, thanks for your uh, for your study, for your work. I uh, I don't always congratulate consultants for the work they do, but I, I think your company did a, a good job, a good job on this, uh, a thorough job. Now, that's not to say I agree with uh, with everything you've got in your document. I thought perhaps there was maybe a little too much vilification of Miller Street. Uh, very interesting that uh, one block in our entire municipality got so much attention. I fully realize the problems with Miller Street. I, uh, I, I'm not, uh, uh, not saying there aren't difficulties there, but uh, I do think uh, there are measures that can be taken to keep that street open. It is counted upon by many, many of our residents every day. It's one of the very few arteries uh, to get uh, either through our urban area or around it. Uh, a lot of discussion uh, still there. W one thing I am disappointed in, um, we know there's going to be a lot of uh, development in our area uh, that's pending and it's, uh, and it's out there, it's going to happen. We know we have a lot of visitors and they come primarily from the south. And there's one north-south road that I don't even know was mentioned in your report. And that's the seventh line to St. Vincent. Mm -hmm. St. Vincent seventh line eventually runs down into Gray Highlands uh, onto into a county road, ends up in Flesherton. Flesherton's on Highway 10, a main artery from the south. If you go west from Flesherton, you hook up to Highway 6, a main artery from the south. And I don't see a lot of, a lot of detail about this seventh line. That's a road where a lot of people are going to be coming up this way to visit us. And uh, 
I would suggest maybe you take a look at our St. Vincent Seventh Line. Okay, I will digress. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Councillor Greenfield. And back to you, Deputy Mayor. Your Worship, thank you. And uh, yes, I, I comment and, and question. Um, in regards to Miller Street, I certainly support a considerable further exploration of uh, that cul-de-sac. We know how the residents on Miller Street uh, feel about the cul-de-sac, but it is, as has been stated, a very prime um, route for, uh, for reaching uh, um, our highway. And I worry about putting too much emphasis on Nelson Street, so we need further, uh, further work on that. But I wanted to ask you, Mr. Johnson, if you had had any uh, communication with or consultation with our snowmobile club, um, a few years ago, this council talked about uh, bringing snowmobiles into the urban core for the economic benefits of that and the convenience of our snowmobilers. But in 475 pages, I didn't see any mention of uh, snowmobilers. So I wondered at this late date if you would consider having consultation with that club. Okay, uh, through you, uh, Madam Mayor, I believe I can answer some of these questions, including Deputy Mayor's question. Um, Deputy Mayor, I, I just had a look at the list of stakeholders and I don't see the uh, Snowmobile Club listed on that list. Um, th and we would be willing to uh, consult with the Snowmobile Club. I would say that the Transportation Master Plan tends to focus on transportation uh, a little bit more, sorry, transportation in terms of people and goods movement more so than recreational travel. And so therefore we are not, for example, looking at hiking along the various trails. Uh, we are looking, at, but, but they are factors for transportation. So we would be willing to look at that. Um, just in response to a couple of the other questions we heard, uh, thank you, Councillor Bartley for your, uh, for your comments. Um, I perhaps don't have the best answers, but I can try to answer some of your comments. Uh, in terms of the public meeting that was held in the live stakeholder session, um, during COVID-19, we've been uh, working with uh, various municipalities on having public e engagement events and the live sessions. And it's, um, it's always, it's a question for the industry right now, which is what is the best format? Do we allow people to type questions or to speak out loud? Um, we've, heard, we've heard mixed measure, uh, measures on both. And I, and I do understand your concern that you preferred strongly to, uh, to speak verbally. Uh, so thank you for that in, input. Um, in terms of your your comment about the plan being overly weighted towards cycling, um, I don't I don't necessarily agree because we did spend a lot of time looking at agricultural goods, traffic, pedestrians, sidewalks, all other modes of travel. Um, we also did hear quite a bit from stakeholders and the public about cycling. Uh, including on our stakeholder committee, we had, uh, give me a second, we had Bill Abbott from the South Georgian Bay Cycling Coalition. And those parts of the plan were intending to respond to those comments that we heard. Um, and your last comment was about paving roads. Understood that it is a, an expense and very costly to pave roads, in particular rural roads. But that part of the TMP was uh, looking at addressing some of the concerns we heard from public, including um, agricultural public, which uh, flagged that they're having some pretty significant difficulties with certain roads and that there's a need to maintain and upgrade those services. So uh, it's, uh, it's by no means perfect, but it is our effort to respond to those issues and needs we heard. And um, to Councillor Greenfield, your comment about Miller Street. Yes, thank you for your comments. Uh, we, did, uh, we did, through the study here, uh, some concerns about Miller Street and we developed that plan for a cul-de-sac. However, during this feedback from the second round of consultation, we did hear that there are concerns about that. And that's why we decided in the documentation that we can't simply say convert it to a cul-de-sac. Instead, we said, that the plan requires staff to go back to, to council and to the public for further consultation and study of that. It's actually quite a complex problem. I have a traffic engineering background. I looked at it and there's not an easy solution because uh, upgrading that road to make it meet standards would be very, very expensive. You have a substandard right of way, you have 
uh, a drop off from the side of the road into the into the uh, the river valley, and um, fixing those two issues would <laughs> would cost a lot of money. And therefore, the the cul-de-sac option was looked at as perhaps an alternative, but but by no means uh, can we make a firm recommendation without further study. So thank you for your comment there. Uh, and then lastly, your comment on seventh line. Thank you for that comment. Um, we can look at it closer. I do. We do recognize that it's an important uh, north-south Meaford road and appreciate that it provides that access to Flesherton and a bypass of Thornbury. So that's a great comment. Thank you. Thanks for that, uh, Scott. And we have uh, Councillor Vickers next and then Councillor Kentner. Thank you, Your Worship. And, uh, and Mr. Johnson, uh, and I, I don't know whether it's just what I'm hearing is, is maybe not what actually happens, but it seems like if your group talks the loudest and the longest, you seem to get more preferential treatment from the plan. And I, I'm not exactly sure whether that's that's the proper way to do to go about business. Uh, you know, you brought up Mr. Abbott's name, uh, Bill Abbott's. He doesn't even live in our municipality. And it, it'd be easy for people to say, you should spend this money when they aren't paying the tax bill. Uh, it, it's hard for a councillor to, to get past the people's wants and needs with the, with the price that everything costs. And you know, to do it in a way that it just seems like we're, we're listening to the loudest and the, and the ones that talk the longest, um, I'm not too sure that's the proper way about developing uh, a strategy. So I, I guess you can either confirm or deny that this is what kind of happens and this is how these strategies uh, are brought forward. You know, I, I guess I would prefer more of a, a bit of a scientific uh, sort of analogy instead of, you know, the popularity contest. So I just like to hear your comments on that, uh, Mr. Johnson. Okay, thank you for the comment, Councillor Vickers, through you, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, my response is that um, certainly the, you know, certainly we try to understand and listen to all voices, and sometimes we do hear more from certain groups in developing these plans which can direct the conversation. And uh, so I, I believe you have a fair comment. Um, that said, I believe the plan we developed really does look at the vision and goals that I ran through in the presentation. And those were brought uh, for the first PIC, the first public consultation event. Um, and so uh, to, to me, the, uh, the plan does properly reflect the vision and goals and it does include all modes of travel. I don't personally feel it's a plan overly weighted to cycling. Uh, I believe it's fairly weighted. It's an important mode of travel and there's some tourism potential there. Uh, but again, we also had a great deal of focus on the roadside, on other safety aspects, looking at the sidewalks and looking at those pedestrian crossovers. So uh, I believe it's a, a quite well-balanced plan. Thank you for that. Councillor Kentner, you were next. Uh, thank you, through your worship. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson. I, I'd love to buy you a coffee someday and uh, chat about a lot of things about this report. But what I'm really concerned with is that, uh, that the, the real value of this report is it's about the only document we have now that looks at a planning horizon as far out as 2045. And uh, it's a very long uh, document and uh, filled with charts and bar graphs and so on. Um, I really uh, had a problem uh, when I saw as much ink given to the, uh, the Gray County uh, outline, which talked about us gaining 1,340 new residents between now and 2045. And uh, I'm just, would you tell us what you think uh, the future holds as far as population for the municipality is concerned? Thank you, uh, Councillor Kenner, through you, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, that's a great question. And uh, to me, uh, Meaford has a great, great news story there. And that is that Meaford is not shrinking and losing population like so many, so many municipalities in Ontario are or have been. Um, we are seeing some development and some growth. Um, now, whether growth on its own is a, uh, or whether that extent of growth with a thousand residents is a good thing or a bad thing, I guess, I'm not sure I can fully comment on that, but to me, uh, to me, there's a positive parts of that and the transportation master plan should respond to those. 
And some of those concerns were highlighted. Those are issues like the de- where the developments will put traffic onto the road network. So in, in the plan, we looked at those intersections and roads and those development locations informed those recommendations. So uh, the safety and operational needs of that development were considered in, in the plan. Um, and just my last note is that uh, with COVID-19 and the shift to work from home, I do see myself that um, places like Meaford, and we see this in the industry, are suddenly getting a lot more attention that people don't necessarily need to uh, live in Toronto if, if they only need to go to the office once a week or once every two weeks. And over time, that could be positive as, as people uh, become more interested in, in places like Meaford. Okay, Councillor Bartley, back to you. Uh, thank you, and uh, to Scott, it could be Scott, or this could be a Darcy question. You mentioned in the report that uh, to afford this plan, we need 2.4% increase. Um, th- is that over and above? I don't know if you're aware that uh, as a municipality for the last five years, we put 1% to roads and 1% to bridges each and every year in addition. So is this 2.4 over and above that? Um, Through your worship, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, So yes, it is. The the 1% that we are currently um, getting each year um, through taxes um, is to meet our road SODI, um, the the deficit identified through the road SODI in 2014. Um, And so that money is used to continue to provide maintenance to our existing roads. Um, This money is for those additional projects identified through the transportation master plan. Um, That 2.4% essentially, if you um, one year um, took that through taxes, the next year you wouldn't have to take it because it's already in there. So it's a one-time amount of money, I guess, or increase. Um, and once that increase happens, then it would be incorporated into our um, budget. Um, we know it is a lot of money and there are some important projects on this list. And that was one of the reasons why through the master plan and what Scott touched on is that grant funding is also really important um, with these transportation master plan projects. And the reason that some of these projects are identified through the transportation master plan, because it provides us a greater ability to get funding so that we can do them. Um, Because without that master document identifying the need for them, then it's hard to get that funding. Um, So there is definitely budgetary constraints, but we're hoping there's different ways that we can get that money. Thank you. And uh, over to you, Deputy Mayor. Your Worship, thank you. And uh, Mr. Johnson, another question for you again. You speak to um, recommending bridge closures in the report. And uh, this council has said, as we uh, amended our bridge zoning, that we wanted to keep all bridges open. So um, just wanted to ask you in terms of your recommendations, which would then require detours around closed bridges, and you talk about uh, reference of distance of detours and safety and so on. And I'm wondering if you have, or if you feel um, we should consider the economic impacts of those closures, assuming most of them are in the rural area and they have significant financial impacts on the uh, agricultural operations that are adjacent to those uh, bridges. Is that an approach that, uh, that you took as you talked about these bridge closures? Thank you for your question for you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, Yes, those criteria are all very important. And uh, I do have a little bit of experience with this topic. It is a a fairly common issue among Ontario municipalities that I've done transportation master plans for. It's a complex topic. There are bridges that have very, very low traffic flows per day, but that are still very important links for uh, you know, for, for farmers, for example, there can be a bridge that only gets used, uh, you know, once a week as for field access for agricultural equipment. And it can look like that bridge can easily be closed since there's good routes nearby. But closing the bridge would require heavy equipment to go a very long distance around to get to the other side. 
and perhaps use other busier roads that farm that are less desirable to use. Uh, so it's a very complex topic. That said, uh, other municipalities are faced with the same issue. And in some cases, there are bridges being closed uh, that meet those criteria. But I do agree the economic impacts and further consultation is always uh, is always needed. So consulting with those that use the bridge and that would be impacted by it. Thank you. Councillor Vickers. Councillor Vickers. Yep, just slow getting the, the mute off there, uh, your workshop, uh, through, through your workshop. Uh, Tori, I don't know if this is a question for you or Scott, maybe you have a bit more information on it. But can, so I've heard this, uh, this uh, Canadian National Active Transportation Strategy. Is it a, is it a grant that's is, is something new, I'm assuming? I haven't really, except for the last probably month or two, I don't think I've ever heard of it before. And do we know how much money will be, well, you said $400 million, uh, Scott, I think was the number I wrote down. Um, like how, how do we know much about it or, or how much we might be able to, uh, to top from, uh, from this uh, grant? Okay, so uh, through you, Madam Mayor, uh, you're testing my knowledge of the program. Um, my understanding of it is that right now it's going through consultation at the federal level that certain municipalities across Canada, cities large and small, are uh, being consulted with on what the criteria would be to apply for that funding and how it would be shared. So uh, my understanding is that those details are not yet available, but what it is is that the government has identified that it would be for active transportation projects. Uh, to me, that could mean everything from bike lanes to multi-use paths to trails to uh, bicycle parking if, uh, if, and smaller projects like that. Um, so that is a program that is currently in the late stages of development, uh, but I'm mostly intended to use that as an example because depending on uh, politics, new programs do come and go over time. Um, some, some programs require uh, like some funding programs from different levels of government require um, plans to be pre-approved uh, in order to be funded. Other programs require plans to be shovel ready, so design completed. So there's different types of programs that come out uh, as the government tries to respond to the need to support the economy. And, uh, and that was intended to be one example. So I'm sorry, I don't have more details on that for you. Darcy, did you want to respond to that? Uh, thanks for your worship. I just because it seems to be uh, requested of council. Uh, my understanding is that it's a $400 million project over a five-year term that would be used to either build or expand on pathways, bike lanes, trails, and pedestrian bridges. Uh, so what we're really talking about here probably is a, a project or a program of $80 million a year uh, that is a national project. So we'd be fighting against everybody across Canada. Thank you. So Supplement, it, supplementary from uh, Councillor Vickers. Yeah, if I could. Uh, yep. So when you put it in perspective, I'm not really maybe getting a real good feel that this is going to be a like really a lot of dollars or or something that, uh, that the municipality uh, could use in in all areas if it if it is uh, uh, directed towards uh, more of the cycling program sort of thing. Would that be a fair assessment? To, Tori or Darcy? Like, am I getting my hopes up too high that this might get us something? Because when you really start talking about the numbers and it's a national program, I'm starting to kind of do the math in my head and it's telling me that it's not a, not a whole lot of dollars. Tori, are you? Uh... Yeah, sure. Three words of thank you. Um, I mean, we do apply for grants for all different sorts of projects annually, um, and these programs all have specific requirements that you have to meet for your projects to be considered eligible. So this will be the same um, a lot of the time. Um, my understanding is that some of these grants, if you get some, you might not get others. So we continually apply for them. And you know, in hopes that we will get some, we're more successful in some than others, just based on um, where our municipality sits. Um, but it just it really depends. And as Scott had mentioned on, you know, where the federal government sits at different times and, and where their focus is. Um, so we will 
we will work with the program to have our best shot to get money um, as we do for all of our grant funding opportunities, but um, really it's out of our hands in a lot of cases um, after that. Thank you, Tori. Bouncy Greenfield. Thank, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, again, just briefly uh, to Scott, I, I did find your report on the bridges uh, very interesting. Uh, similar to our state of the infrastructure report that we've had for a few years, but there were some, uh, I think there were some uh, variations uh, from that. But what I did really appreciate, you had a list, a long, quite a long list of potential structures for, uh, to be used as bridges. And uh, some of them I had not heard of. And uh, it, it's just good to have this, uh, this list that you presented uh, for reference in, in the future. I, 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 think, I think we'll make good use of it. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and uh, back to you, Mr. Johnson. And, and I appreciate Councillor Greenfield's comments. I was going to uh, ask about uh, alternative bridge structures as you had, uh, had listed. Um, so just back to my prior comment on uh, economic impacts, um, I'd like to ask Mr. Johnson and, and Tori, if it's possible to add that language to the document because uh, economic impacts weren't, uh, weren't considered with uh, some particular bridges that we have closed at the moment. So it's just, I, I feel it's important that uh, that language be included in this report going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. And, uh... Uh, Tori? Thank you Sorry. for your worship. Um, just to add to the bridge report, um, we are working with Scott and his team on an additional report that will be kind of an addition to the transportation master plan. Um, and once we receive that, it builds on the road SODI um, document from 2016, um, identifying some additional criteria to look at those bridge closures um, and so we will be bringing that forward with a report once it's prepared um, so that um, they'll be able to have more discussion about it at that time. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tori. Darcy, yes, please go yeah, ahead. I think it's just, it's important to, to say this and I, I wanna make sure that this is clear. I'm not too sure if everybody picked up on this, but the deputy mayor suggested that the current bridges that were closed, economic impact was not considered in that. I think it's important to make it crystal clear that economic impact was considered in the environmental assessment that was completed for those bridges. And economic impact is a portion uh, of the data set that is absolutely required in any EA process. For some people who use the bridge and live locally, they may not have liked the outcome and may have thought that the economic impact should have scored higher in the overall process, but I wanna make it clear that economic impact was absolutely considered through the EA process of the closure of those bridges. Thank you for that, Darcy. And over to you, Councillor Bell. Thanks, Madam Mayor. So Mr. Johnson, uh, I read a portion in the, uh, in the report uh, and I thank you for including it. I had asked our CAO whether I as a councillor should bring forward a notice of motion to discuss the uh, possibility of electric car uh, charging stations. And uh, I'm glad to see that that's uh, been incorporated and that there has been some thought on that. Um, I do see that as occurring in our society sooner rather than later. So I was glad to, uh, to see that that's in the report. And uh, I thank our CAO for telling me I didn't have to do a notice of motion uh, to have that included in your transportation master plan. Thank you. Okay. Are there any further questions for Scott before we let him go? And uh, with thanks for a very, very comprehensive, not only report, but presentation today to uh, get us thinking about the, the way forward. I see no further hands up, so I will. Thank you at this time, Scott, for uh, all the, the hard works that you've done and to you, Tori, as well. Um, and we will move on. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Council. Okay, we're moving on. We have no deputations of, on agenda items before us today, but we do have uh, four registered for public questions. And so um, 
we will move into that at this time. The first one, noting that I would ask us, we have a very long agenda ahead of us, and I would ask our uh, participants here to please uh, observe our two-minute rule for, uh, for public questions. Uh, first one we have ahead of us is Victoria, and we see Victoria today. Welcome, Victoria. Please go ahead. Uh, in 2018, Council approved a recommendation to amend the site plan at Gates of Kent. This amendment was executed in the absence of an actual application, ignored concerns expressed by the public at the time, did not conform to the official plan, and failed to even consider EMS accessibility and emergency evacuation, which were the only conditions of the recommendation that you as Council approved. Are you surprised to learn that until my family started making private inquiries in the spring, EMS had never been consulted on the plan change and even notified or even notified of the installation of these bollards, which they have since confirmed they cannot safely traverse. My family has been asking important questions of council staff and the fire chief for nearly four months only to be met with silence or to get punted and told that this is a private condo matter. I have a child at home who requires IV transfusions overnight to survive. At any point in the middle of the night, the pump may fail and we have no more than five minutes to wake up, assess and fix the problem before she's at increased risk for thrombosis, sepsis, acidosis and multiple organ failure. Every moment matters. If we need an ambulance in the middle of the night, which could already be slowed down by overnight snow, adding yet another unnecessary barrier to block a critical access to our home is simply an unacceptable risk. Because of this risk and the municipality's four months of silence and inaction, my family is being forced to move. My questions to council, do you care that no engineer to date has reviewed and stamped an amended site plan? Do you care that the bollard manufacturer months ago, and which we told you, confirmed that the bollards installed and approved by staff were not designed for emergency access and can damage emergency vehicles? Do you care that no proper process or review was ever undertaken on this amendment? Do you care that the recommendation you approved in 2018 doesn't even meet its own conditions? Do you care about the safety of the remaining 82 households at the gates of Kent? Will you stop punting matters of public safety onto a condo board and private residence? And will you formally review the validity of this amendment and your approval in the interest of public safety? Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. First off, yes, of course we care. And we most especially care for the challenges that you and your family have um, with regard to uh, the health concerns. So we certainly do. I just want to say right up front that uh, we know that staff are continuing to work with the uh, um, Reed home, Homes and their uh, engineers and lawyer um, with the, uh, together with the property management and the county emergency services as well. So that work is in process and uh, we will have more to say on that subject later. But thank you for your concern and we do wish you the best. Thank you. Our next speaker is Trevor Hesselink. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Trevor Hesselink. Uh, obviously I'm a registered planner and I'm an urban designer who's been studying pedestrian safety issues for over 30 years. Um, I'm Victoria's husband. Uh, to settle that. Uh, my question for you today is about the municipal direction to erect bollards at the gates of Kent, same thing where my family and I live. This question follows from the sequence of letters I've sent to you uh, beginning days after the bollards were mysteriously installed at the Center Street Access uh, this past February to the letter and attached liability list that I provided to your attention this past Friday. Um, I have extend raised extensive concerns to you, my council, about matters of increased risk to resident safety that have been imposed on this vulnerable community as a result of this planning transaction. You could read the detailed list and that in those materials I've provided. Uh, the facts are a matter of municipal record. Council's decision made years ago to amend the site plan of this 82 household community and affecting such important key design risks as emergency access, traffic flow and pedestrian safety, important things was supported by a three page staff recommendation, absent much critical analysis. Uh, my question for you is this, if that recommendation had informed you that both the amendment to remove the sidewalk and also the bollard idea were contrary to numerous county and municipal planning policies, and if it had mentioned that driveway length was not an actionable harm to counterbalance the loss of a common sidewalk element and street access, and if the recommendation had identified that no through traffic danger had been verified, that traffic after the bollards would be heavier at one end disproportionately, backing up dangers would be more prevalent, servicing would be less efficient and more dangerous, that emergency access would be notably riskier, and that overall pedestrian safety would actually be diminished. 
And if that recommendation had told you that other options to dead ends existed that would not contravene official plan policy direction and impose these risks, then would you have approved this amendment? Because these key facts are among many others that were conspicuously missing at that time. The municipality has the power and the mandate to quash this approval. An additional application can always be brought forward by the condo on better merit. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hesselink. We appreciate your comments. Uh, Lance Park is next to speak on this issue. Please go ahead. Um, can you mute yours? Yeah. Sorry about that. We both unmuted at the same time. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's better. Thank you. And I, I'm uh, so sorry. Did I uh, mispronounce your name? It's PASC. Please go yes, ahead. It, thank you. Um, now, one of the problems with the, these ballers is that people have been lured into a false sense of security and believing that the, the vehicle, the emergency vehicles can drive over them. As we all know, we live in a snow belt area. If we add two, three, four inches of snow to those bollards, they are completely null and void. They cannot mm -hmm. be driven over at all. Now, we've, we understand that moments matter when it comes to a medical emergency. Um, pe if people don't know that with every minute that passes, if you're having a heart attack or a stroke, your chances diminish by 10% every minute that you are not immediately attended to. Now, another thing that people don't realize is that we live in an area with a lot of old trees. As of uh, May the 13th, we had a tree come down across Russet Avenue, or sorry, Muir Street, and it potentially blocked emergency vehicles. Last year, or maybe the year before, we had a huge uh, bow come down on Union Street, almost taking out uh, mailboxes. And that it stayed there for a while because it was obviously not blocking the road. Now, what people don't realize is that um, perfect storms can happen. We can have somebody having a medical emergency, we can have a road blocked, and we can have no access to health and safety. I don't think anybody on the council wants to deny us that, uh, that we should not be live in a safe community. And right now, that's what it is feeling like to, to me and to a lot of uh, individuals that live in this area. Uh, I'd just like to thank you for your time. And, uh, and I hope that uh, our requests haven't fallen on deaf ears. Thank you so much, uh, Lance. I appreciate the, the time that you've taken. Um, and Elizabeth, uh, I guess you're next. Hey, thank you very much. Um, I too am also going to be speaking um, as I'm a resident of the Gates of Camp, except I am going to be talking in regards to an actual experience I lived through regarding safety. My career was in disaster management and emergency response. One of the office buildings I was working at in Toronto the townhouse complex right next door to it went up in flames. It spread so quickly, it was just unimaginable. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, fire crews were on the scene. There was probably at least half a dozen, if not more fire trucks. They blocked the entrances, the people in the office building, although they were capable and able to evacuate the building by walking downstairs and moving over to our emergency assembly location, they were not able to get their cars out of the garage or out of the parking lot, which was right beside where the townhouses were on fire. The cars consequently in that parking lot melted and all the windows in the office building were also either exploded inwards or were melted. Um, in the gates of Kent, the townhouses are very close together. They are very poorly built. If one went up in flames, it's very easily, very easy that uh, the fire could quickly spread from one to another to another. We have a lot of seniors living in here with uh, mobility issues. For example, we have an elderly gentleman across the road from us who cannot walk. 
if we had to evacuate, we might not be able to, the residents would not be able to get into the cars and walk out. That is a very huge safety issue for me. And now knowing that EMS has confirmed that the ambulances cannot get over the bollards, if Union Street is blocked with fire trucks, that raises another huge concern. So I am speaking from my own experience and living through something like this. And therefore I would like to ask council if they would consider stepping in to formally review the situation in the interest of safety of, of everybody living in this complex. I wanna thank you for your time, Madam Mayor and council. Thank you, uh, Ms. Baskin. We really appreciate uh, not only the situation you described for us and uh, but uh, the, the importance of safety of all of our residents. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your uh, for participating in the public process, and we will certainly uh, consider the uh, information that you've shared with us today. Council, we have reached uh, uh, one and a half hours of sitting. I think maybe it's time for a very short break. If we uh, can just uh, reconvene here at uh, 2.31, five minutes, please. We'll return, uh, we'll uh, uh, please close our... Uh, cameras and our sound until then. Thank you. Councillor Kentner, you are not on mute.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. <laughs> we had a little bit of a stretch, at least. We're moving into now council inquiries, an opportunity for council to ask questions of staff. Councillor Bell and Councillor Kennedy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is for, uh, for Tori. Um, in years past, um, I have uh, asked this question and I've received uh, similar answers. So I have to stop asking this question about dust suppressant uh, in our rural community. And I wanna ask it this way. Is there a technical reason why we do not apply the dust suppressant when the roads are extremely dusty and we do not have to wait until the rest of the roads getting their three inches of new gravel and it's followed up after doing that. Is there a technical reason why we don't do it even now before the rest of the roads that are getting their gravel get their gravel? Uh, Three Worship, thank you for the question. Um, and maybe I have uh, an answer that you will be happy to hear. Um, we have been in contact with the contractor who completes dust suppressant for the municipality um, and have him lined up to come, I think this week to start completing um, any of the dust suppressant work on our corners and in front of um, houses close to the roadways, not on roads that will be receiving their gravel this year, um, recognizing that the it, roads are dusty um, and that we have received some comments from residents. So we have made sure that that is happening prior to the granular contract this year. Thank you for that. Well, that, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. That's, uh, that's actually good news because there's been years, and I know that you are personally aware of this, that we've had dust suppress and put down very late in the year into August, almost uh, why bother uh, doing it? And uh, I'm uh, just, I'm glad to hear that because I was considering doing a notice of motion to change the operations uh, like I did with uh, winter road maintenance to do a non-winter road uh, enhancement of putting suppressant down earlier. So I do appreciate this comment this year. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bell. And I believe Councillor Kentner was next. Thank you. Through your worship, a question for uh, Mr. Armstrong. Um, I, I guess it is simply uh, now that we have heard from uh, from four uh, uh, deputants uh, concerning the uh, uh, the situation at uh, of the bollards at Gates of Kent. Uh, what is our way forward uh, on this matter? Um, because we we did uh, all of us receive a very uh, detailed and well researched document from. Uh, Mr. Hesselink, uh, detailing uh, the issues that, uh, uh, so I, I just, what is our way forward? Yes, uh, through your worship, as, as the, uh, uh, the mayor mentioned, I have been continually meeting with the number of parties on this matter because uh, obviously there's the original developer and their team, uh, there's the condo board, uh, there's the property manager, um, and actually we do have a meeting with the property manager and EMS tomorrow. So I continue working on that. Um, I, uh, I have been advocating uh, uh, that if there's an option that works better for the group, uh, we're fully supportive of that. Um, I question our ability to force things on them and I will continue reviewing that. Uh, but that's uh, right now the discussions have been positive and uh, we'll continue that. And I'll report to council as I, get information further from those groups. Thank you for that, Rob. Um, Councilor Bartley. Oh, sorry, that, I beg your pardon, it's Councilor Greenfield. Thank you, your worship. I, I'm not nearly as good looking as Councilor Bartley, so I'll, I'll accept that. Um, this is uh, through you to Director Victoria and uh, We've, uh, I have, and I think others have mentioned uh, Miller Street uh, earlier today, and it'll get a lot more talk. Uh, anyway, we're, we've got construction, we've got big time construction coming to our urban area uh, very, very soon uh, on, uh, on Sykes Street and uh, also on the Nelson Streets, particularly the Hill. I'm 
I am very worried about Miller Street. I, I don't want anybody to think that I don't have uh, safety concerns about Miller Street. I do. And with construction on Sykes and Nelson, we're going to have a lot more traffic on Miller Street this, this summer, uh, at least for part of the summer. And that's maybe the last thing we need there. But there are traffic calming measures we can take. Uh, Director Victoria, I I'd, uh, I'd really think if it's possible, at all possible, we should put them into, uh, uh, into existence as sooner as, as opposed to later. Um, Certainly, uh, reduction in the speed limit, uh, maybe a, a flashing speed limit sign, uh, if, if it's possible to get hold of one. Some more OPP presence just on occasion. And, and what I'd really like to see is the, uh, the load limit uh, cut back on Miller Street Hill. I, I, I'd like to see nothing heavier than a single rear axle on that, uh, on that hill. Uh, and no trailers behind it. W what can we do? I, I don't know if I'm the only one who's worried about, uh, about that, uh, that short stretch of road, but uh, I, I am worried and uh, it's, it, it could get very hectic there this summer. Can you help me out? Thank you. Thank you, you Councilor Greenfield and through your worship. Um, so there are, a, like we do know of the concerns and there are a couple of things that we are doing. So um, the main one is that we are working with the contractors to try to reduce any overlapping scheduling of works. So the Nelson Street project water main work, which will impact the roadway um, is proceeding um, starting this week. Um, and so it's intended to take less than a month to complete that work. And after that, all of the work will be on the water tower property. And so um, there shouldn't be road impacts. Um, and just as a reminder, um, there will be one lane remaining open while that construction is happening on the roadway on Nelson Street. Um, the Sykes Street project um, is not um, going to be starting until um, a couple weeks from now, um, and they are intending on keeping one lane open at the beginning of the project um, as they get started. So again, reducing those impacts as there is some slight overlap between those two projects. Um, so re residents utilizing their normal routes shouldn't see um, as significant impacts with that scheduling um, that we have worked on with the contractors. That being said, um, we do have our portable speed signs that um, council approved last summer that we are putting on Miller Street this week um, and will be there for two to three weeks, um, which will overlap with that Nelson Street work. Um, those signs do collect data, including speed and traffic counts. So we'll be able to see um, what type of traffic is occurring on that road. And if we are seeing um, significant issues, we have passed along some previous data we collected on Miller Street to the OPP, um, identifying some of the concerns we have with speeding along that roadway. So they are aware of the concern. Um, with that being said, some of the other items that Councilor Greenfield identified, including um, lowering the speed limit or changing the load limit, um, some of those will require council direction or we will need to pass bylaws to allow those to go into place. Um, so if council does want to proceed with any um, staff will just need direction to do so. Thank you for that, Tori. Uh, supplementary, Councilor Greenfield. Y yes, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Victoria. I appreciate, appreciate that. I, I have to admit, I thought the... Uh, the one way on Nelson was going to be longer. You mentioned it would likely be a month. Uh, so that's, uh, I, I was thinking it was going to be two to three months. So that does give me some, uh, uh, some consolation. And uh, yeah, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate the efforts and uh, uh, there, there might be something coming forward uh, concerning uh, further, uh, further restrictions, uh, safety restrictions uh, on Miller Street. Okay, thank you, Councilor Greenfield. Anything further from Council? Deputy Mayor? 
Your Worship, thank you. And on, I guess a lighter note, a question from Mr. Chapman in relation to the library. Um, I know that we've had a lot of dry weather, but I noticed walking past um, a lot of uh, seagull droppings on those beautiful windows and siding. And I just wondered if there was any uh, thought of putting some spikes along the roof or any deterrence that might uh, might keep those seagulls at uh, bay and not uh, not dirtying up our beautiful new building. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, we're kind of just hoping to be able to use old scarecrows from the scarecrow invasion and we'll put them up on the roof, but uh, that didn't work out since the invasion didn't happen last year. So, um, no, we're, we, we are aware of the potential long-term issues with regards to uh, bird droppings, and we're in the process right now of looking at uh, what deterrent measures are available. Um, some are, are better than others, uh, apparently, but some come with um, more potential harm to the, the bird as well. So uh, we're trying to weigh all those options at, at the, you know, in the short term, at least at this stage of the game, you know, we'll just uh, pressure wash the building a couple times a year uh, when it's necessary until we can get something in place. Thank you, Darcy. I'm seeing no further hands up for inquiries. So we will now move on then to uh, motions and bylaws for decision. 7.1 is our consent agenda. And we have four items that we have discussed in the past meeting. And um, we will look at which ones of these might you, know, you might want to pull. The first one is COR 2021-29 is to approve the award of tender. Uh, for the Trowbridge Street resurfacing and parking lot reconstruction to Tri Capital Construction Inc., um, including the provisional item for roadside safety devices for $162,912.56. Um, the second one is INF 2021 06, is the recommendation that the uh, municipality of Meaford continue to utilize the rubber tire excavator to complete ditching, vegetation management, culvert replacement, and winter maintenance. C is the bylaw 2021-43 for that uh, roadside vegetation management policy to enact the bylaw. And D is INF 2021-07, the Gillies Bridge um, deferral that the Council of the Municipality of Meaford approved the deferral of Bridge 15 reconstruction project to 2022. Are there any of those four that anyone would like to pull for independent uh, discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask for a mover and a seconder to move this as, as one. Councillor Bell moved and Councillor Bartley second. All in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. So moving on to items for consideration. The first one is CAO 2021-08 as an organizational structure and additional staffing resources. The recommendation before us is that the Council of the Municipality of Meaford approve the proposed departmental realignment. Now, two, authorize the recruitment of a full-time Director of Development and Strategic Services. Three, authorize the recruitment of a full-time IT coordinator. Four, authorize the recruitment of a full-time parks and facility services coordinator. And five, authorize the recruitment of a contract development review coordinator. This uh, has, the report has been uh, circulated, a very in-depth report, and I will now open it up um, for questions of Rob on any of those items. Councillor Kentner is first then. Please go ahead. Thank you, through your worship. Uh, just a, a question of, of Rob. I, I found it uh, um, difficult to understand why the strategic services wouldn't be under the, uh, the CAO rather than under the, uh, under the, uh, the planning uh, I just. Yeah, through your worship, I, I guess everything is under the CAO uh, by virtue of, of the structure. Just we would have, uh, as proposed here, 
um, we would have a director overseeing the communications and the marketing um, at the director level versus the CAO. Um, so I guess, yeah, it's hard to explain um, other than that. It's, it's to have the CAO overseeing every division and then uh, the, the four directors and then that director be in planning strategic initiatives, which is the economic development, marketing and communications uh, planning and building. Um, and then that would allow the manager of, of uh, planning to more focus on just planning, uh, whereas the director would oversee the building and the strategic initiatives. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, just, uh, if, I may, if I may, I, I just uh, I urge you to consider the possibility that uh, uh, communications being such a critical part and, and, and uh, council's strategic initiatives uh, such a critical issue. Uh, I'd like to see the CAO uh, have direct uh, responsibility for that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Kentner. And before we go any further, I need a mover and a seconder to put that on the table for discussion. A little lapse in memory here. Uh, Deputy Mayor and Councillor Vickers, thank you. All right, now we can carry on. Any further uh, questions for Rob? on this recommendation, Councillor Bartley and then Councillor Bell. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I actually have a couple of questions to start. Yeah. The IT coordinator, um, I, guess, I guess I'm not there all the time. I have a hard time believing we need two full-time IT people. Is it possible to keep the IT person we have and contract the rest of it out as needed? Uh, instead of hiring another full-time person? Is that possible? Um, I can start and then maybe Darcy can elaborate because IT falls within his division. But I think for the most part, we are convinced uh, corporately that uh, our capacity to get a qualified individual uh, to handle the IT would be have to be based on a full-time uh, position. What we're looking at here is um, the existing IT technician would more focus on security protection and high level network maintenance. And this other position would be the frontline support. So basically what you term uh, the help desk person. So someone can't print or someone can't uh, do the more basic tasks, which um, take a lot of time to resolve and do, uh, we do need that position based on our demands in the organization. I don't know if you want to expand on that one a little more, Darcy, or? Uh, sure, I think, you know, first to just hit on Councillor Bartley's question about contracting. We do have a contract service right now um, with a uh, local supplier. The, one of the reasons that this is um, being expedited as a need is because we, we went through training their tech four different times with four different staff and only to have them leave shortly after being trained because they moved on to different organizations. We've now been told that that uh, company is uh, going to be shuttering uh, their doors. So we actually don't have any local support. Uh, so we'd have to go out and try and find somebody uh, to do that. More importantly, I think it's really, you know, Brady's done a, a great deal of uh, education and, and upgrading himself to try and understand IT needs over the last two years since he took over the portfolio uh, because he wasn't an IT guy, but he's doing all the help desk stuff right now because there's nobody doing it. So we have a manager doing the help desk stuff. And more importantly, I think, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that, the pro that COVID hit and the province changed the deadline for the asset management plan and extended it another year, we wouldn't have hit the deadline for asset management plans because Brady is spending too much time on IT and not being able to actually complete the asset management plan because IT is a daily need. You know, we support 80 full-time staff and, uh, you know, volunteer firefighters have now been brought on for um, email and a bunch of seasonal staff get it. And we've got phone plans and IT connectivity issues, which have already been, highlighted in a facility uh, report for council, we absolutely have to have a second person. There's, there's no doubt about it. We've reached out to Owen Sound and Town of the Blue Mountains to see if they would be willing to 
contract out their staff to help us and and they're already at the limit as well uh you know folks like chatsworth um they're going through uh, a complete it overhaul and they've uh, they contract everything out to a company in Guelph. So if something goes wrong, uh, they could be down and out for, you know, hours and hours uh, organizationally until somebody from Southern Ontario makes it up. So, yeah, this is, um, in my mind, um, making sure that the organization can still move forward and especially given the, the COVID pressures, this is actually the most critical position of the whole bunch in the report. Because without it, organizationally, we will just continue to fail. Darcy? When, uh, another question, or should we go around the table? Uh, let's, uh, we've got one more. Councillor Bell is after you, so let's do that, and then I'll come back to you. Councillor Bell? Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. So this uh, this report is, uh, is one that is... Uh, I know it's, it's great concern to myself and I know it is of concern to my fellow councillors and it's extremely important subject matter. And um, after going into closed session and now we read in our report, we, we know that there are changes that are required and we know that the demands are increasing. And I would just simply like to say that my next few comments don't come don't come easy and without some deep consideration. At this particular time, when we are going to be moving into a service delivery review um, shortly, um, I, I would like to postpone until we get that report, um, all of the positions except for one. And the one that I did give consideration to moving forward on was the IT person. And we know on this sitting council what happened when we had a malware attack. We know that with uh, our staff working from home, we know that there are other demands on connectivity that we have witnessed even recently with the telephone system and internet. It's, everything is kind of on its edge and it is kind of falling apart. And to support the CAO, in his requests. I'm not non-sympathetic to the request to run the municipality efficiently, needing more employees, but I am reserved from the simple fact that when we did our 2021 budget, my fellow councillors, you recall when I asked about the financial implication of where we were sitting with the number of staff at that time, we're over $8 million for staff. And as we continue to add to this, the burden that we are putting on the ratepayers, we're now encroaching in the next 2022 budget, we're probably going to be on the edge of, of $9 million for staff. So I believe personally that we have staff in some cases, in some areas, more staff than what we need. And there are other areas from my personal view that we need to bolster staff in other areas. And so at this time on this report, I would support the IT person, but I would ask that we go through the service delivery review and Mr. Armstrong, I hear you, I do understand you and I'm listening and I'm reading when you have folks that are away on long-term disability and on short-term disability and the stresses that that makes. I also believe that when people have good jobs with the good positions that they have, I believe that working together with the common goal of making this municipality better, we have a lot of people on staff, and I know that you are aware of them, who do want to give the extra mile and have been giving the extra mile. And I recognize that, but at this time, I won't repeat myself again. That is my position on this report at this time, uh, Mr. Armstrong. Rob, did you want to respond? Um, I, I think that was probably, Your Worship, more of a statement. The only thing I will add is the service delivery view is probably a year out. Yeah. 
And considering the development pressures and the development we're dealing with now and those demands, that will be too late for us to keep up with those development pressures. Uh, I think that's uh, the one comment I will make to the, on the specifically on the development and the manager, uh, the director position and the CEO's responsibility. I just would like to comment uh, too on the on the comment about the nine million dollar burden on the taxpayer. I think one of the things that we have to recognize as we move this forward is that this is going to this is pertaining to growth. We have wanted growth. Uh, we are now getting growth, and we must have uh, the staff in place to manage that growth appropriately to the standards that uh, uh, that council and our residents have have expected so that uh, the costs that are associated with this increase in in staffing will be accommodated in in ways that uh, can be um, attributed to the growth and uh, moving forward and maintaining um, the standards that uh, the council have established for ourselves so i just wanted to put that in uh, that comment in. Um, and um, Steve, uh, Councillor Bartley, uh, you had a second question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, I do understand with the growth that's about to hit us, we, we need to jump up our planning. I do agree, Rob, that maybe you should be just taking over the CA role um, and, and that only. Uh, a question I have is with all the uh, new buildings and whatnot. I don't know why we need somebody else on the parks and rec committee. I really, or the department, uh, I don't understand how we need more staff to run the parks when we're getting more buildings. I don't understand that. Maybe somebody could explain it to me. And we may need, I would like a little lesson probably from the, our treasurer. They keep on saying that uh, as you go forward with more increased buildings and increased uh, taxes that it is neutral revenue that you get all kinds of new buildings but you don't gain on money because you have to spend more on services to get that new buildings so is it a true fact uh, Darcy that that all the buildings were about to uh, maybe pass it's going to be neutral revenue and we will not be any further ahead towards a tax base uh, through your worship, I, uh, I'm not too sure about the rest of council, but I'm sure Deputy Mayor Keevney will remember conversations from as much as five to seven years ago about this topic, where I've advised for a very long time that there's study after study after study that shows that chasing residential development will not actually support the existing residents and lower their tax burden. The best that we can hope for is, as a community if residential development is the type of development that is occurring, is to ensure that it is neutral to the existing taxpayer. And the benefit to the existing taxpayer is that they have access to additional services that are demanded because of the population increase. But I think yeah, the best and easiest example that we could ever look at is our neighbors in town of Blue Mountains. They have grown exponentially over the last 15 years. And that growth and assessment is always considered in their budget, but at no time in the last 15 years have they actually had a negative tax rate increase. So they have always used the growth, plus they have still had to increase the budget above the growth. And that's because you're always having to provide new services, more services or upgraded services. And just Darcy, uh, maybe if you want to continue on with the, the parks and just to explain that one. Well, um, sure. So on, on the parks and facility services side, we actually had a halftime person uh, helping, like a halftime admin person helping out parks and facility services from 2015 to 2018. Uh, when we went through the reorganization uh, at the time in, in 2018, staff asked for a full-time uh Parks and Facility Services Coordinator. Uh, council decided to approve all the other uh, staffing changes and upgrades with the exception of that position because the intent at the time or the recognition of council was 
we're going to see how this goes. There's already half time support within parks and facility services. You know, this is kind of good enough for right now. Uh, in 2019, the organization went through uh, a further change when the infrastructure services group was reborn. And at that time, that coordinator position that was shared between transportation and parks and facilities was transferred over to the transportation services side 100% of the time. So from that point on for the last two years, we've had no support. So it was proven back in 2018 that we actually needed full-time support. Council didn't move forth with it then. And then in 2019, all support was removed from the division. And we've been struggling for the last two years. It is the only division in the organization that doesn't have a coordinator or administrative support. And with the exception of cultural services, it's also the only division that provides nothing but forward-facing programs and support to the public. Thank you, Darcy. Deputy Mayor, you were next. Worship, thank you. And uh, this is a difficult one. Adding staff is, is always uh, challenging for council to uh, to adopt and, and to understand. But I, I listening to the CBC this morning, they were talking about uh, GDP growth and Canada's uh, slated for a 6.1% increase. And uh, we've been certainly not going to be left behind in that. We know with our building report before us today and with the development ahead of us, as, as we've uh, already talked about, that uh, MEPRID is, is really taking off. And uh, if we're going to meet that growth and not try to catch up to it, I think you know, we have to support uh, these additional positions. So um, two questions, I guess. One, I'm hoping um, for a communications piece to come from staff to help our residents understand this, uh, because uh, I think it's important that uh, we provide explanation to them for these uh, positions. And uh, second question um, for you, Mr. Armstrong, is uh, do we have uh, office space for uh, these additional uh, people? Yeah, yeah through, through your worship. Um, so on the communication piece, totally agree with you. And that's some of the things we've talked about council is is working uh, in communicating the need to the public uh, so they can understand uh, these requests and why we need uh, these positions in place uh, in moving forward. Uh, with regard to office staff, um, we will need to work through that. Obviously, we're very tight in space. We are looking at, at different options. Um, we do have uh, some remote locations that do have some availability. So we'll be working through that. Um, technically, uh, right now, um, I think we're looking at um, uh, the parks and facilities would probably go to uh, where that position used to be working at the arena. Um, so that that one would be the IT would be working closely with uh, Richard um, and he's off working remotely. So really, there's not a lot of positions that require uh, the in-office support. So it's not a big concern at this point in time with, with those requests. Darcy, have yes, here. To, to your worship, I think, um, you know, council provided direction just a short period of time ago with regards to corporate facilities and the recognition that, uh, you know, we should be looking at the um, existing library for a short-term solution to get us through the next 18 to 24 months. So that's what my team and the facility sizings is actually working towards. Uh, with an expectation that we should be able to to provide uh, somewhere between 10 and 12 office spaces uh, in the fall of this year to alleviate issues to make sure that as we move back into having complement back in in office that we can spread out some people who are too close together right now even uh, and then also taking some of those people out of the um, precarious working conditions that have been highlighted prior, previously to, to council. So we would, we would be able to accommodate additional staff uh, within the next uh, three to four months. Councilor Greenfield. Thank you. Uh, if, if I may, through, uh, through you to uh, either Mr. Smith or Ms. Margaret uh, Wilton-Segal, um, we have uh, four positions mentioned here and they are uh, they represent a number of different departments. Uh, I'm wondering if we could uh, 
as opposed to voting on the, the four, four position package, if we could vote on numbers two, three, four, five individually. Um, do we need a, a motion for that or uh, could we just do that? Uh, thank you. Um, through you, Madam Mayor, we can absolutely take this in part. So it just needs a request from a member of council, which we've just had. Um, what I would say, though, is that numbers one and two are so inextricably intertwined that numbers one and two would need to be done together. And then numbers three, four and five could each be done individually, if that's what council's wish was. Councillor Kentner. Through your worship, I realize uh, there's uh, something sort of on the table here. I, I just wanted to throw out, uh, it would really be beneficial for us to hear from our new HR person about these uh, recommendations. I don't, I don't see anything, uh, any input from the, the new HR person. And uh, part of our problem, I think, is simply the fact that I don't think we've had a, a full year yet of the, the arrangement which we all agreed to, uh, where we you know, set up, re did a realignment. And uh, I, I appreciate that it's a, a combination of uh, forces that have uh, uh, made it necessary to reevaluate it this time. We've got a lot of development and we also have a lot of people on, uh, on disability. So uh, these two uh, issues don't make it easy for staff and, and I appreciate that. But uh, could we just hear a little bit about uh, the role that our HR uh, executive has uh, had in this? Yes, through your worship. Um, so Sean Morphy has been very much involved in uh, assisting us in the preparation of this report, including editing it, updating it, speaking to the short-term disability. Uh, so he has very much been involved in, in the generation of this report um, and, and his assistance in establishing where he also sees some of the pressure points and concerns about um, where the risks are to the municipality and our, our responsibilities to continue delivering the services that council has expects us to deliver. So I guess really that's all I can really say at this point. I do, he's not on the call, uh, but he was very much involved in this process. And Rob, I think that, that that is a very good point, not only the HR um, uh, uh, staff um, involvement in here, but in the way the whole um, uh, proposal for the realignment of the departments occurred uh, was a consultative process from what you and I have discussed and what I believe uh, to be your the way you operate as our CAO and as our leader. Uh, from the staff perspective. And I think that this is a, a, a statement that um, lends huge credibility to what it is you're trying to, to do here, which is um, with the involvement of all of the department heads, um, uh, directors, and mm -hmm. looking forward to accommodating the gaps and the needs that have occurred, um, fully cognizant of our long-term and short-term disability situation that has uh, prompted many of these things. So uh, it, it seems to me that uh, the first one, uh, the approve the, uh, the realignment um, and the rest then should fall under your um, direction, the, the role of the CAO to properly assign uh, staff and, and uh, recruit staff as needed for the individual positions. Um, I think that this is a, a, a credit to um, your leadership in terms of the cohesive and collaborative approach to, um, uh, to finding a solution for what has become a pretty critical um, staff situation. So uh, are there further comments coming forward from Council? Um, Council Bartley? Thank you, Madam Mayor. And in, in number two, authorize the recruitment of a full-time director. I, I, I don't like that word. I think director heightens the pay scale. Uh, is this true or not true? Would it be, how about a full-time manager of that department? Does that change the pay scale in any way? 
Um, through your worship, um, we have a manager of strategic initiatives. We have a manager of development services through this reorg and removing the director of planning from me, planning and building uh, from my position, we do need that director position. So it is an elevation. It is putting you know, on par with the other three directors, uh, Tori, Matt, and Darcy. So that, that is what's suggested. Suggested, but is it necessary? It is necessary, yes. Thank you. So we have a um, move. Um, Worship? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, worship, sorry. Sorry. I've just been trying to uh, run some numbers in the background based on the very first comment from Councillor Bell. Uh, just wanted to clear things up. So uh, Councillor Bell is correct that our total payroll uh, organizationally is around uh, $8 million. Um, the report suggests that that uh, this would increase the overall cost by about um, you know, $350,000. The expectation of cost increases for the 2022 budget, if we're looking at 1% COLA plus the step increases and CPPEI, all those kinds of things, would probably, uh, I haven't done those numbers yet, of course, because we're, we're just in the, we haven't really started the budget stuff, probably somewhere in the 100 to $130,000 range in total uh, for all of those. So we'd be still under 850,000 or eight and a half million dollars. I think another thing that's important to note though is that eight and a half million dollars is not the tax supported payroll because there is about $850,000 of that that is related specifically to water and wastewater that's fully covered off by the user rates. So, you know, the net, in, the net taxpayer supported salaries even with all of these increases, will be somewhere around seven and three quarter million dollars. Thanks for that, Darcy. So uh, we have a, a, a suggestion that we take these um, individual requests and vote on the first two together, and then three, four, and five. Um, do we, Matt, do, do we need a mover and a seconder for that and for each one or can we just go on the original one? No, okay. you always just carry forward the one that you've already got. Thank you. Is there anything further for discussion? Are we ready to call um, a vote on, on this recommendation? Councillor Bell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just for myself, for clarity, uh, we break this apart. What is the combination of item one? It's to approve the proposed departmental realignment, which consists of the full-time director of development of strategic service and a full-time independent CAO role. Um, well, Madam Mayor, I, I, I think we have another dynamic, of course, which is in the mix. And that, that, of course, Madam Mayor and fellow councillors is the review of our CAO. And I, I think I'm gonna leave it at that, that I think at this time asking for that split on that, I, I think I would like to have that review also under our belt. And um, Rob, you and I did talk that I, I really look forward to having an engagement in closed session um, with yourself on the dynamics of this municipality. And I, I don't think I want, at least I won't be able to support it. If it's, if it's kept together, I, I don't think I can support the split, but that's, I'm just one of, I'm just one of seven. But thanks for the clarity, Madam Mayor. Um. For you, Madam Mayor, for maybe I can just explain why I'm, I'm saying that those two are, the, are one and the same. Um, if Council is not approving a Director of Development and Strategic Services, then there is no departmental realignment. And equally, you cannot have a departmental realignment without having that additional post of another director. So that's why those two have got to be together. So, Councillor Kentner. Uh, thank you, through your worship. Uh, 
I, I think what I'd like to ask for is just uh, a little more time, uh, perhaps, you know, postponing the, the whole uh, recommendation for, uh, for two weeks while we could perhaps have uh, some kind of, uh, uh, and maybe it would be uh, an in-camera session, but some, some kind of meeting of minds. So, because I, I, I hate uh, at this point to be voting against this, uh, realizing you know what what senior staff is up against, but but I do feel that there is a lot of uh, angst, and th the problem for council is that uh, once we vote yes, uh, you know uh, we have upped the ante, and there's no there's no road back. You know what I mean? We we are committing ourselves to a, a major expenditure, and and it isn't even the expenditure so much in my mind as uh, getting it right. And uh, I, I just feel that council is not fully satisfied and, and, and it's not criticism uh, of, uh, of uh, Rob or anyone. It just, I, I think we, we have not had the advantage of a discussion. In our last closed session, we had a presentation and we certainly had an impassioned message from you, uh, Madam Mayor, which I certainly took to heart. Uh, but I feel that we have had no opportunity to really discuss it. Uh, either amongst ourselves or more more uh, closely with staff. Matt? Um, for you, Madam Mayor, and with the greatest respect to Council, I, I do take some issue with some of the most recent statements. Um, there was a closed session held two weeks ago to discuss both long-term disability and, and the CAO's uh, performance review. And for council to say that there hasn't been enough discussion, well, that, that's council's role. Um, that particular closed session stopped at approximately three o'clock. And I know that both Rob and I, who are the staff members involved, would have stayed there till seven o'clock if council wanted to discuss it. So, you know, I think postponing these things because you haven't had enough discussion, well, here's your opportunity to have that discussion. Um, this is why we do these things. And, and so if we postpone this two weeks, there won't be another discussion because this is now an open session report and must be discussed in open session. Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Kentner. Well, I, I just want to be clear that uh, we had a presentation in the closed discussion and uh, we did not, that presentation was about the, the challenges of uh, uh, of uh, the disability uh, uh, issues and also uh, the challenges of uh, development, uh, pressing development. But we did not discuss at any time uh, these five you know, measures that are being recommended. And we have had uh, about 10 days to look at them and uh, digest them, but we have not discussed them as a council. So uh, I'm prepared to discuss them if others want to, I just, uh, you, you've heard my concerns with it and, and other councillors have concerns too. Matt, did you want, uh, sorry, uh, Rob first. Yeah, just uh, for point of clarification, these uh, positions were highlighted in the in-camera session. Um, it was the last part of the, the in-camera session where um, I expressed the challenges and, and um, my, what I would determine the most critical components that provide the most risk to the municipality for us to continue delivering services. So we did have, I did highlight these positions in that, that session. Um, but yeah. Um, for you, Madam Mayor, from a governance and, and legality point of view, the reason why a detailed report like this wasn't presented in that closed session is because this report has to be an open session. There are no exemptions that allow a conversation about whether to recruit four additional staff and do a departmental realignment to happen in closed session because the public should be able to hear council's discussion. So this is your opportunity to discuss it. If you feel you haven't had enough time to review the, the proposal, then you can absolutely defer it to another occasion, but it will be another meeting exactly like this one where you can have that conversation. Deputy Mayor. Your Worship, thank you. And I, I appreciate the comments. And certainly I, re, I recall this uh, request in the closed session and, and we knew this meeting was coming. And I think, uh, you know, facing the elephant in the room, if we were being asked to 
fix a road or a bridge or buy a new piece of equipment, it would be a much easier decision. But because of the perception that we all face in the public that the municipality has too much staff already and, and the costs and everything that go with it, it makes it very hard for council to wrap our heads around adding four more numbers to that list. And I think that's what we're really struggling with here is, uh, is how we're going to be able to uh, explain ourselves. Because I think at least I understand why these positions are necessary. We've got this incredible growth, not just ahead of us, but here, it's here. And, and we've heard that. We've heard the challenges from our staff as, as they try to deal with that. And, and if we want to be successful and sustainable as, as a community going forward, we have this, uh, this opportunity. It's, it's here. People want to be in Meeker. And uh, if we don't embrace that now, then how is our reputation impacted? And, and how does that flow back onto the development community and our business community and, and so on and so forth? So I think that's the struggle is the fact that you know, we're being asked to add staff numbers and that's very hard for all of us, but uh, I, I understand why they're needed and I will support all four of them at this time. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. I'm going to um, echo that. I think that uh, part of the dilemma that uh, we have and as a council is uh, history, is our past practices and is the the uh, comment and the perception from many in, in the community that we're too small, that we are not large enough. We're, we're not to be compared to larger city, cities and, and larger communities like Collingwood or Owen Sound or any of the others because we're just too small. Well, we're not too small there. We are moving, we are, we are getting larger, we are growing, we have been discovered. And we have to be forward thinking as a council in order to make sure that we have the resources to support that growth and support the, the uh, expectations, not only of our current residents, but also of the future. Um, if we don't show that leadership, we're, we are, I think, abdicating our responsibility to those who did elect us. So sorry, I saw some hands, uh, Councillor Bartley and then uh, Councillor Vickers. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And as most of you know, I'm a person that dislikes hiring people. Um, I'm also a person that totally respects our senior staff. And we've had a request for these additional staff, not only a request, we've had a very emotional request for these additional staff. And uh, I agree with uh, Deputy Mayor that we have to answer to the people. And I, I can support today's request and I will take any phone call that anybody in the municipality wants to call me and we'll talk about it. And the reason I will take this request and go forward because I do see the need, I do trust our senior staff. I trust them wholeheartedly and I believe that it's a true request. And then we're going to do a uh, service delivery review and the chips may fall differently after that, but you can't. Yeah, you can't put the cart. You can't put the cart before the horse. So I, I will support this request as we speak. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Bartley. Councillor Vickers, you're next. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, and I echo a lot of the same things that uh, Councillor Bartley has just said. Uh, uh, Rob, I have great respect for you, and uh, if our C CEO and, and his senior staff come to say to council they, they need more help, they can't deliver the services uh, as requested uh, without more help, then I am going to, uh, to believe Rob and, uh, and respect his decision and his, uh, and his ask. So uh, I know there's people that won't, won't be happy. I'm sure uh, I'll get a few phone calls. And I, and I won't divert them on to, uh, to Councillor Bartley. I will take them myself and, and explain to them uh, the process that we've gone through. Uh, again, I, I believe in, in Mr. Armstrong. And, uh, and if he asks, then I feel that uh, I'm willing to grant his, uh, his request. So those are my opinions. Thank you, Councillor Bickers. Councillor Bartley, back to you. 
I should have added this to uh, my little talk. If you are uncomfortable supporting this, I have no issues with that. But you need to come up with services. Do you want to cut today so that we do not need to increase our staff? It, it's a two-edged sword. Thank you. I'm sorry, um, Councillor Bartley. You were really breaking up. <laughs> Did everyone understand what uh, what Councilor Bartley? Okay, so that was just my hearing. That's uh, good. Thank you. Is there, is there are there any? So got back to you then, Councilor Kentner. Thank you, Your Worship. No, I, I did not understand. Uh, I, I, the breakup was pretty substantial, and I didn't hear what uh, Councilor Bartley was saying. So could he repeat it, please? It, you're, it was indicating, uh, Steve, that your microphone was off. I don't know if that had anything to do with it. If you could repeat what you said. Uh, um, I don't know if it's the microphone off or the municipal trucks that are outside my door banging. Um, <laughs> basically, if you, cannot, if you cannot support this today, you have to come up today with what services you want to cut in the municipality so that these... Uh, um, positions. Now we're frozen. <laughs> okay, well, I think Councillor Bell, let's move on to you while uh, maybe we'll see if Councillor Bartley come back and join us. Well, thanks. Thanks, Madam Mayor. And um, so on the, on the subject of whether we hire people today, and uh, I did uh, catch that my fellow councillor Bartley said that possibly in the future, uh, maybe after the service delivery review, we could uh, revisit it again. It's been my experience that when you hire somebody for the municipality to have those uh, individuals removed from their position is a very lengthy, long, and it's generally not done. So when we decide, if this council decides to hire people, they're going to be hired and they're going to be in and we're going to have them. And uh, I want to thank Mr. Smith for reminding us that this is the opportunity for us to speak. And uh, I don't have a problem uh, speaking on the fact that uh, we have heard over and over uh, that the stress level because of COVID has been, in some cases, it's been really, uh, it's been really rugged. On, uh, on members of staff. And uh, even inside this report, uh, we read that uh, having public meetings has been stressful on staff because it was welcome from a democratic point of view that the public engage and let us know how they feel about subject matter. And at the same time, it was presented in the report that it was somewhat onerous and it was different for staff to handle this kind of comment from the general ratepayer. And so I am suggesting that we, if we have people who are on the inside of this municipality mm. and they feel that they are uh, overwhelmed, that they are, that there is too much in any business, people have to make a decision for themselves and for their families, what is the very best road for them? And if they truly believe that things have, and I'm just going to say, if they've got to you, if, you, if you're overwhelmed, you may have to make a decision. And that will mean that our CAO will be required to replace type for type. And we can do that. Mr. Armstrong has that ability right now. If someone leaves and we need someone, he has the ability to go out and hire and to replace. The requirement of hiring new people is the requirement and a decision which is made by this council. It is not simply the CAO going and doing this. So I most definitely welcome an open conversation like this. And if we have to have this uh, decision made today, um, I, I may be the only one that will not support hiring these four uh, individuals uh, to be determined in the future with cost implications which will ultimately, no matter what, uh, is going to be tax. And we are going to be faced in the future with all the dynamics that this council is facing. Our tax increases may well hit double digits. And we are going to have to decide, as my fellow councillor Bartley said, 
what services may have to be trimmed. And I also am prepared to do that. But I also don't think that we really have to. I think we can manage what we're doing because even though our ratepayers who are moving into this area have some very high demands, we can make the decisions on what those service levels will be. So Madam Mayor and fellow councillors, I may be the only one of seven who may not wish to move wholeheartedly into hiring these uh, individuals as requested, but I too am ready to take phone calls, whether I have made the right thought process or the wrong. So thank you very much. Just if I may, uh, Deputy Mayor, just quickly, uh, because I wanted to reference the look at the service delivery review, which is going to uh, come forward and it will be about as uh, our CAO mentioned about a year out in terms of looking at the service delivery, uh, a fulsome service delivery review. But I just want to um, clarify that uh, it is not always, um, in fact, it rarely happens that in a fulsome service delivery review uh, with public input and public expectations clearly understood that um, there is a reduction in staff is, is, uh, is recommended going forward. So we need to be, be very, very well aware of that, I think, uh, um, it, you know, going forward. If we realign our uh, staffing situation now, it may be thoroughly supported and, and then and with a, either a further recommendations for increased staff, uh, keeping in mind the services that uh, the expectations that our uh, residents and our council want. So I just want to make that comment. And uh, Deputy Mayor, over to you. Thank you, Your Worship. A comment and a question, if I may. And just um, as recently as uh, late last week, uh, Mr. Armstrong and I had a conversation with a potential developer, and it was wonderful to hear uh, Rob talk about uh, how quickly things could be turned around here in Meaford in comparison to other communities with uh, moving development forward and, and we're getting that uh, great reputation of me for being a, you know, a good place to do business and, and we certainly want to want that to continue. So if we're going to make that happen. Then we have to have the appropriate staff in place. But I have a question from Mr. Chapman and I don't know if you'll be able to answer me, Darcy, but now that we've had the draft uh, master transportation plan and it's suggesting 2.4% and now we're looking at a number here for staff, and considering uh, the budget, uh, as you outlined it for us um, um, in 2021, uh, looking into 2022, can you give us any hint at all of, uh, of, of what we're looking at uh, at this point in time? Just help us with this decision. Uh, through your worship, no, <laughs> that's a big crystal ball. I don't know, I, I would say, uh, like council hasn't approved the implementation of the transportation master plan at this stage of the game uh, it doesn't have to be done year one it doesn't have to be done at all um i think there you know are going to be significant pressures on this year's budget because of you know a bunch of different things um we may have some saving grace in some other areas though i think that's you know as a starting point probably you know, including this three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, five percent ish, probably, uh, within council making some decisions. I mean, this this is, uh, you know, two and a half plus percent uh, alone, and then if you add another two and a half percent for the infrastructure funding, you're at five percent. So everything else being equal, you're still around five percent. Darcy, I wonder if I could just add as a, an addendum to that, if you have some uh, comments to make on um, the ex expectations of the increase in taxation revenue due to growth um, in the, the coming forward uh, with the growth that, uh, that we've been expecting that would, that would uh, go to offset uh, increase in taxes or in, um, in expenses uh, that could be applied to growth. It, so usually, uh, you know, the best growth projection we can get is sometime around, uh, you know, June, I would say, going forward, because a lot of the growth is the building permits that happened last year that impacts finally picking up for this year for supplemental mm -hmm. taxes. And then, you know, they might get 
some of the stuff that comes on stream uh, early this year as part of this year's taxes. Uh, based on last year's activity, uh, we, you know, we had a stellar year, but some of it was institutional because, you know, there's, and there's no taxes towards it. So I going to be, um, you know, hopefully not uh, held by feet to the fire on this number uh, if things change, but I would assume 1.2% is probably reasonable at this stage of the game. Uh, which gives you, you know, give or take one hundred eighty thousand dollars, and I think that that, you know, my five percent number is probably reflective of recognizing that growth. You know, we've got costs increase on the operating side of things that you can't get away from. Um, you know, like uh, uh, insurance and utility and and you know, fuel costs are now back up just as high, if not higher, than they were pre-pandemic. So, you know, we we had a an easy year last year. Um, you know, we're going to have to make up uh, most likely forty-five thousand um, dollars at least, based on the fact that we had hard-coded seventy thousand dollars into the budget for the parking program. Based on moving forward with this, just you know, as the, the test pilot for future years, so that's effectively probably going to be lost revenue. So I think all in all, you know, five percent probably isn't uh, outside the you know, the realm of possibilities. I mean, one thing that we still have to tackle is that, um, you know, we've got facility funding that should have went up, um, you know, in excess of $600,000 last year. And what happened was we actually went back to sub $400,000 to try and make the budget work. Um, you know, we still need $650,000 in, in facility funding for 2022. So there's a $250,000 gap there that needs to be made up as well. So. There'll always be give and takes the council are going to have to contend with on an annual basis. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor, I think you were next. Uh, Your Worship, thank you. I think that answers my question for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Greenfield. Thank you, Your Worship. And uh... Now, Mr. Chapman has, has partially answered my question. I was going to ask him about the facilities uh, situation, um, how much it would, uh, it would cost uh, next year to get, get back in line with, uh, with what we're trying to do. And it uh, sounds like it's, uh, it, it, it's going to have an effect on the, uh, on the tax rate too. Um, Frankly, a tax a tax increase of five percent doesn't really impress me much. It doesn't inspire me. Uh, to me, that's uh, that's higher than what I would like to see. We we talk about development. We know it's it's out there. We know how many uh, proposals we have on our desk or almost on our desk. Uh, certainly, Loon Call has been approved, and it looks as if it's going to go ahead. Skydev, uh, right now it's, it's an unknown, just how that will, will end up. Uh, but I wanna remind uh, folks, uh, we've had a development approved, uh, approved out of Meaford Haven now for something like eight years and it's still sitting there. Uh, there's no money come in from that one. Uh, so development proposals are, uh, are inspiring, but they're not always cash in the bank, at least not right away. Uh, Mr. Chapman has already told us that uh, with development, there comes expenses and uh, maybe the, uh, the net uh, it's, uh, it's nothing better than just a, a, a write-off. We're asked to make a decision on these staff positions today. And, and if, if we say yes, then that, that's a given. That's, that expense is guaranteed. Uh, developments, there's really no guarantee on them, folks. Uh, we're, we're pretty optimistic, but there's no money in the bank yet. Um, so I, I'm, uh, I'm really having trouble with it, with this. Uh, don't forget, we've got another recommendation coming up a little bit later to hire two more staff people. Uh, so <laughs> this, is, this is not easy. And uh, if council has some, uh, you know, some hesitation here, I think we should have. 
And again, we're here to represent the public. And there is a public voice out there uh, that's going to be very difficult to persuade if we keep going down the path of simply hiring more employees. Do we need them? Perhaps we do. That's our decision to make. That's the decision we have to make. And uh, we've had a good discussion here, Your Worship. I think uh, uh, with all due respect, maybe we, maybe we should get on with it. That, Councillor Greenfield, um, Deputy Mayor, and um, Matt, perhaps uh, if you'll yeah. pardon us, uh, Deputy Mayor, I'll let Matt go first. Sorry to just jump in here, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to clarify something with Councillor Greenfield. He referenced another two positions later in the agenda, and unless I've missed something, there, there are not. Mm -hmm. um, you're perhaps, Councillor Greenfield, talking about the appointment bylaw for the summer municipal law enforcement officers? Uh, yeah, I, I see a nod. So that that's not additional staff members. That's budgeted money that we've that we've had in the budget to perform things like parking enforcement. Um, we just have to pass a bylaw so they're actually eligible to enforce it. That's not a request for additional staff at all. Okay, thank you, Mr. Smith. I appreciate that clarification. Thank you. Okay, Deputy Mayor, over to you. Um, Your Worship, and, and just a thought, which may unfortunately muddy the waters, but uh, the report that's coming up later on our agenda regarding the uh, Fourth Community Division Training Center payment in lieu, um, there, perhaps there's an opportunity there to talk about uh, some of those recommendations, and they're all good, and I support them all, but if we're struggling with funding these positions, maybe there's an opportunity to give consideration within that report for some of the funding required, just putting that thought out there, Your Worship. Over to you, Rob. Thanks, yes. Shirley. Thank you, Worship. And, and um, I'll speak for Darcy when we have learned that we don't want to use one-time funding uh, to offset the operating. That's why we as staff have put those together. And we'll talk about that on one-time projects so that it doesn't uh, create future problems in that regard. So that's why you, the project you see there are all capital projects, one-time funding, so it won't impact the long-term tax dollars and things like that. So. Thanks for that, Rob. Well, we have had a very fulsome discussion. Are we ready to call the question on, and we will do it uh, piecemeal, as has been suggested? Is there anything further that council wishes to put on the table before I call the question? Okay, seeing none, then we'll move into um, the recommendation that the council of the municipality of Meaford, the first item is to approve the proposed departmental realignment together with authorize the recruitment of a full-time director of development and strategic services. I will call a question, Councillor Bell, did you wanna make a comment or are you voting? Uh, make a comment, Madam Mayor. Uh, could we do a recorded vote as we go through this? Certainly. Thank you. Councillor Kentner, did you have a comment? I have a question uh, uh, through your worship. Uh, just. Uh, as I read this, if we vote yes to one and two, we don't need to vote on three, four, and five because they're part of the uh, proposed departmental realignment. I mean, am I wrong? No, the, uh, Rob? Actually, or, or Matt, uh, yeah, actually, I would say you need to vote on those specific. The realignment, as Matt mentioned, is really the restructuring to create this new division with the director. And that's really the purpose of the realignment. Although the, uh, those th three other positions are shown on the structure, it's not really the realignment. So they should be considered separately. Thank you. And Matt, you, you, did you have a that, comment? That was gonna be exactly my comment. Thank That's you, Madam Mayor. Okay, I was gonna say the same thing. So um, we have a recorded vote request. And um, 
Can I just, Madam Mayor, just clarify with Councillor Bell, does he wish a recorded vote for all four of these uh, small categories? I see a nod, so, so we will do that. Okay. So let me just grab the right thing on my screen here. Thank you. Um, so the first question before Council today, then, as we take this in parts, is um, the Council of the Municipality of Meaford, one, approve the proposed departmental realignment, and two, authorise the recruitment of a full-time Director of Development and Strategic Services. Uh, we always start the list with the person that requested the recorded vote. So, Councillor Bell. No. Councillor Bartley. Yay. Councillor Greenfield. Yes. Councillor Kentner. Yes. Councillor Vickers. Yes. Deputy Mayor Keevening. Yes. Mayor Bob Clumpus. Yes. Uh, that motion carries six to one. The next motion on the floor is that Council of the Municipality of Meaford organize, authorize the recruitment of a full-time IT coordinator. Councillor Bell. Yes. Councillor Bartley. Yes. Councillor Greenfield. Yes. Councillor Kentner. Yes. Councillor Vickers. Yes. Deputy Mayor Keevney. Yes. Mayor Clumpus. Yes. That motion passes seven to zero. Uh, the next motion on the floor is that Council of the Municipality of Meaford authorise the recruitment of a full-time Parks and Facility Services Coordinator. Councillor Bell. No. Councillor Bartley. Yes. Councillor Greenfield. No. Councillor Kentner. No. Councillor Vickers. Yes. Deputy Mayor Keevney. Yes. Mayor Clumpus. Yes. That motion passes four to three. The final motion on the table is that Council of the Municipality of Meaford authorise the recruitment of a contract developments review coordinator. Councillor Bell. No. Councillor Bartley. Yes. Councillor Greenfield. No. Councillor Kentner. No. Councillor Vickers. Yes. Deputy Mayor Keevney? Yes. Mayor Clumpus? Yes. That motion passes four to three, and that concludes the motions for that item. Thank you all. Um, may your worship, may I ask a question? Yes, please. Please go ahead, Councillor Vickers. On number, th on number three, if I was correct, I thought Matt Smith, their clerk, said it was vote seven yes, zero no. Correct. And I thought... Correct me if I'm wrong, Tony. I thought you said no to that one. And if I'm wrong, then uh, then that's fine. I just want to, if, if we ain't have a recorded vote, I just want to make sure it's recorded correctly. I believe Councillor Bell had agreed to the IT support. Okay, sorry for that. Sorry, Tony. I didn't, okay. uh, I misunderstood it. No, that's quite all right. Okay, let's move on then to COM 2021-10. The recommendation is that Council of the Municipality of Meaford endorse the proposed Summer Traffic Enforcement Program and authorize the Treasurer to transfer $5,500 from the Policing Reserve to the 2021 Operating Budget to pay for the program. Can I have a mover and a seconder please to put that on the table? Councillor Greenfield and Councillor Bartley. Okay, um, questions for uh, staff and Deputy Mayor and then uh, Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Your Worship. And I'm just curious, um, it says summer traffic enforcement. Is that then primarily speeding or does that include like a ride check and seatbelt, distracted driving and so on? Um, three, Madam Mayor, I can't speak for what the what the police would actually do, but I would imagine it would cover all types of motoring offences, though I, I would doubt it will be a ride programme. They were certainly talking about uh, the speeding offences and, and in, in uh, um, traffic control from that perspective. I would be very surprised if that didn't include distracted driving as well, because often those yeah. go hand in hand. 
Any further questions for Matt? Councilor Bartley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And um, I, I think this would be a waste of money. Uh, it's one weekend of the year. I don't think it shows anybody some strong police presence. And they talk about doing it on Highway 26 mostly, which should be a provincial matter. Uh, I don't know why the municipality would pay $5,500 for them to patrol Highway 26. Uh, I think, Madam Mayor, that, that that is the proposal from the OPP. If the if Council wanted to do something different to that uh, and, and thought that some traffic enforcement was of benefit but focused differently across the municipality, that's absolutely something we can do. Um, the proposal they brought forward was, was just that, and, and the detachment commander has been very clear that we can adapt it as we see fit if we wish to. Yeah. And uh, Councillor Vickers? Through your worship, uh, the money they receive from the fines that I'm assuming will get handed out for, uh, you know, for the offences, is that kind of figured into the, the cost of performing the, the service, Matt? Um, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, these would go through the Provincial Offences Court, and my, I believe that the money then goes to really pay for the Provincial Offences, them, the court themselves. Um, $80 speeding fines don't actually pay for a huge amount, particularly when you've de dealt with the administration of that at the, at the court end. But, but no, they so don't it, have, really, it doesn't impact our rate. We, we have to pay, we would have to pay the, the going rate for, for an officer per hour and, and the number of fines wouldn't have any impact on that. So, so in a way, it's not really a revenue generator. Mm -hmm. No, I think so, it was, certainly not for, for us and, and I doubt for the OPP either. I think it was, uh, it was put forward as an, as a, um, uh, in response to the lack of present uh, comment from uh, some residents that uh, it's very, very um, difficult. There's, there seems to be a lack of presence um, with our OPP officers. But I have to say that uh, on three occasions now, I have um, observed um, two uh, OPP officers on bicycles um, traveling through our community. So uh, the presence is certainly there. But this is a this was a way to increase that presence on on specific weekends. Deputy Mayor, Your Worship, thank you, and I appreciate the comment about uh, patrolling Highway Twenty Six. Does this, this require an amendment then to have uh, enforcement on the roads within the municipality, basically of our choice, or you'll just be able to verbalize that, Matt, with the OPP? Um, I think. One, should council approve this, I would need to have conversations with the detachment commander to, uh, to sort of ascertain exactly how we need to define this. Um, if council's wishes that we do not do enforcement on 26 and, and do it on more local roads, there, then I'd certainly like an, an amendment to that effect. So the, then that's very clear when we're doing it and nobody can say that we've chosen to do the wrong thing. Councillor Bell. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, I don't. I don't see the value in this myself uh, either. Uh, even if we were to redirect the OPP to another uh, road, um, the last time we had our police advisory committee, uh, the interim inspector uh, uh, Deborah Anderson uh, basically told us that they are in a position where they need to increase their staff, and that they have been understaffed for some period of time. And I'd, I can't tell this council this afternoon whether they have acquired those officers or not. But the proposal is that they would be paying officers for a request to do extra service, extra duty time. And uh, what that would mean is that those officers who are currently employed uh, are going to be doing this extra paid duty. And after they've already been doing their, their regular um, shifts. And uh, I, I just don't see... Uh, even though it's a very small amount of money, um, I mean, uh, there's things that this council uh, talks about that sure a lot heavier than uh, a few thousand dollars. But I, I just don't think that we would uh, really see a benefit 
um, of this expenditure at this time. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Bell. Councilor Kentner. Yes, uh, through your worship, uh, I uh, commendable as the idea is. Uh, I uh, I certainly would disagree with all the enforcement being on Highway 26, and uh, we we have. Uh, decided uh, that we were going to really look very closely at all enhancements. And I think that uh, all things equal, that this is a small amount, but I don't think we should spend it this way. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anything further from council? You ready to call the question? All in favor of uh, this proposal recommendation, Going forward, uh, and one, two, three, and those against? One, two, three, four, and that is lost. Okay, moving on to COM 2021-11, the, the Detachment Police Services Board uh, report. Uh, this is a recommendation that Council of the Municipality of Meaford endorse the proposed Single Services Police Services Board for the Gray Bruce OPP detachment, and that the recommendation that each participating municipality and First Nations community appoint one elected official to the joint board with provincial and community appointees forming at least 40% and 20% respectively of the membership. And direct staff to submit a joint proposal to the province of Ontario on behalf of the municipality and in consultation with other participating lower tiers in support of a single police services board for the Grey Bruce OPP detachment. We have a mover and a seconder please to put that on the table. Deputy Mayor and Councillor Kentner, thank you. And we'll open it up to questions of uh, Matt on this one. Councillor Bell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So uh, fellow councillors, as you read through the report, you can uh, clearly see that the uh, police advisory committee that uh, I have been chairing for some period of time, um, it's inside the report that that, uh, that particular uh, advisory committee uh, will likely become redundant. As we've seen in the report, the OPP are definitely moving and are, have in place that if you have OPP in your municipality, there's no more distinguishing on a particular level of level 10 or a 5.1. If you have the OPP as your police service, you have the OPP and everything that they offer in this. And so it was inside the report that having the police advisory committee and as the chair, I actually agree that having, having our, our group um, have input in this, um, personally, I think it would be a waste of our time. Um, I think that there are other dynamics that bring um, important information uh, to the OPP. And I see the structuring that uh, is, uh, is desired here, um, having uh, Gray County and Bruce County, First Nations, uh, healthcare, um, a, a person from the province of Ontario and so on. I see this as being so much larger and having so much more direct impact uh, with the OPP uh, that uh, I, I believe uh, the clerk uh, can verify my comments about uh, inside uh, not really wanting to have uh, the um, police advisory committee as it is uh, currently in place. And with that, Madam Mayor and fellow councillors, if I'm absolutely correct in this, and I hope that uh, Mr. Smith, you, you totally agree that I am correct, I would like to see something done just a little bit differently in a very positive manner. Um, fellow councillors, we all know that we have a recognition certificate and that recognition certificate is given out to businesses or organizations with longevity and it is signed by each member of council with gratitude and congratulations and thank you for your participation. And I would move that upon the dissolving of the police advisory committee, that all the members who put forward their names, who put them forward in good faith 
that they would endure until the end of this sitting council, that through no fault of their own, but through a, a different dynamics which came in from outside, I would move that this council uh, would give each member who is serving on that police advisory committee a, uh, a certificate. The words will be changed. It's not a business, but it would really be a thank you on behalf of this council for those individuals who put their name forward to serve on the council that I chaired. And uh, I, I know that I've said a bit here, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, I hope you can verify what I have said to be absolutely accurate. And fellow councillors, I, I would appreciate um, a support in, in saying thank you to the individuals who, who served on that committee, which I do believe uh, would be redundant. Thank you. Thanks for you for that, Councillor Bell. Um, over to you, Matt. Thank, thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, just to clarify here that nothing in today's report has any impact whatsoever on the Community Policing Advisory Committee today. That committee will continue to operate until such time as, as this council decides that they shouldn't. And, and as I say in the report, I expect that when we bring forward the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan for final approval in September, that's the time that we'll be pro proposing to make some amendments to the advisory committee structure. So I don't think anything needs to be done there today. And, and I should also point out, and, and maybe council is just not aware of this, um, every time any member of any of our advisory committees uh, leaves uh, their position, whether it be at the end of the term or, or halfway through, uh, they all receive a letter from Mayor Clumpus to thank them for their service on, on that committee or board. Um, I'll just jump in, Madam Mayor. I did not know that you did that yourself on behalf of this uh, sitting council. And uh, so there's something that I have learned this afternoon just in a few passing comments. And so um, thank you for doing that, uh, Madam Mayor. It was a little hidden gem that you do. Thank you. Councillor Greenfield. Thank you again. Uh, uh, your worship through you to Mr. Smith. Um, I do prefer option two, uh, although I, I wonder about a committee with 11 members, uh, maybe that's uh, a high number, although I guess uh, Grace Abel, I think, has uh, 11 members, so it's, uh, it's not something uh, uh, out of the ordinary. The rep from the Sogging First Nations, uh, it says one representative. Well, I, I was thinking that would likely be somebody from their from the a band council, but uh, that's not necessarily the uh, the situation. Do, do you know uh, uh, the um, of that individual? I, I would imagine it would be somebody from the band council as well, but but we we don't know that. Um, the First Nations have the ability to do things slightly differently through the the new Police Services Act. And so they will be able to make their own decisions and are taking reports fairly similar to this to, um, to the band council over the next few weeks and in, in recent times. So it, it just says a representative because I don't know what it would be, whereas I know that each of the other municipalities are suggesting it should be elected officials. Um, uh, I will comment that I too feel that 11 or, or 15 in the case of number one is, a, is quite a, a large board and, and may be a little unwieldy. Um, staff across the municipalities involved did consider that. And, and the issue there really comes about representation. Um, if we were to only have a, a seven person board, for instance, bearing in mind we must have 20% uh, each of provincial and community nominees, um, then and some of the municipalities at any given time wouldn't be represented on that board. Now, you know, I would hope that in the long run that people would be able to, to work with that and that the board members would represent the entire detachment rather than just their own municipality. Um, mm. But staff feel across the, the detachment that right now we probably should be having a representative from every municipality present um, at those detachment board meetings. Um, uh, with regard to Councillor Greenfield's comment about option two, I will say, of course, that Council can absolutely change this to, to recommend uh, option two instead of option one. Um, what I will say is that as a detachment, we are required to submit one proposal. Uh, and that proposal must be submitted by all the municipalities together or the province will impose a decision on us. 
So if this council is the only council, for instance, that says, uh, well, actually, I know they won't. I believe Chatsworth has already said that they would prefer a Grey board and a Bruce board. If Meaford and Chatsworth both said that, but the other seven municipalities all said they prefer, preferred one detachment board, then our proposal to the province would have to be for that one detachment board. We'll have to go with sort of majority rules on this one. Do we have further comments? So the recommendation then is um, the proposed single services board for the Gray Bruce D uh, OPP detachment. That's a joint one. Um, yes, that's the recommendation. That's the recommendation. And is that the way, have you been in, in touch with other clerks uh, throughout the uh, Gray County, for example? With uh, Yes, so, so this report almost identically is being reproduced uh, at every municipality concerned, uh, either over the last two weeks or, in, or this week. Uh, I, I actually do need to give credit to my colleague, Brittany Drury at the Township of Georgian Bluffs. She's taken the lead on, on this and, and wrote much of this report for us. Um, but every every member of staff is recommending the same thing uh, to their respective councils. That it be a Gray Bruce OPP? Detached? Yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I personally think I would side with Chatsworth and just have our own Gray Police Service Board. That's my thoughts. Thank you. Any further thoughts? Councillor Bell. Well, thanks, Madam Mayor. I, I would also vote for a gray, a gray board. Um, in that case, Madam Mayor, can I suggest that somebody proposes an amendment to this to uh, amend option one to say endorse uh, option two, uh, sorry, endorse two separate police boards for Gray and Bruce counties. Gray and Bruce. Would somebody, uh, Councillor Bartley and uh, Councillor Greenfield? Um, just yes, Madam I would. Uh... Okay, you will move it, and Councillor Greenfield will second that motion. That amendment? Uh, I will move it if it guarantees us a spot on that board. So for you, Madam Mayor, I can't guarantee anything about this process at all because it is a process that's in the gift of the provincial government. We, we are making a proposal to the province. Um, all of the different options before you include a member of this council being on the police services board, whether it be a Grey Police Board or a Grey Bruce Police Board, there will be a representative from this municipality there. Um, the other thing before you vote on the amendment is that it, it, it's important just to re-emphasize the fact that just because this council says that they want a Grey Board and a Bruce Board does not mean that Necessary. the proposal to the province will, will even say that, and it certainly doesn't mean that the province will approve it. Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm sorry, I must have misunderstood you, Matt. I th thought you said if it's Gray Bruce and you have nine municipalities in Gray and a bunch in Bruce, that you'd only allow seven people or eight people on a board, that we probably wouldn't be on the board. No, no, Councillor Bartley, um, I, I think perhaps you misunderstood. Perhaps I wasn't clear enough. The proposal is that every municipality would have a representative. My, my example about the seven members was in response to Councillor Greenfield's comment of 15 people being quite a large and unwieldy board, which I agree that it is. But the only way that we can have a representative from every municipality is to have a board of 15 for a joint board or a board of 11 for a, for a Grey County only board. Thank you. I, I think perhaps I should also sort of emphasize why staff were recommending the, the single um, Grey Bruce board. And, and really, of course, that, that is that a lot of the issues are fairly similar. 
the, the Bruce um, Peninsula municipalities, and it is only South Bruce Peninsula and North Bruce Peninsula that are part of our detachment. Uh, other Bruce County municipalities either have their own police force or are part of the South Bruce detachment. Um, their tourist communities, their agricultural communities, very much the same as ours. And of course, for, for communities like Grey Highlands, Chatsworth and Georgian Bluffs, and to a certain extent, Meaford, um, with it forming our Western boundary, Highway 6 and 10 is a key issue for those municipalities as, as it is for, for South Bruce Peninsula and North Bruce Peninsula. So, so that was the logic behind doing it together rather than having sort of a, a grey board, but then having the same conversations just across the road in Wyatton. Mm -hmm. Councillor Kentner. Uh, through your worship, I hate to prolong this, but I, I really uh, think that uh, the uh, OPP prefers the, uh, the the two county system, and I think that uh, you know we got a two county school board, and uh, you know uh, it's it's just a line, uh, and we we have so much in common that I think that uh, uh, it's rather parochial, you know, not to go along with option one. Okay, we do have a, an amendment that has been moved and seconded. Um, I will, are we ready to call the question on that amendment that uh, recommends, I've lost it again. Uh, the recommendation is to endorse the uh, two separate uh, police services boards for Gray and Bruce OPP detachment. That is the amendment that we're voting on at this point. Okay, are we ready to call the question? All in favor of this amendment um, to the recommendation? One, two, three, one, two, three, four. Okay, that is carried. And those against, I'll just have to call for those against. One, two, okay, that is carried. So uh, are we ready now then to, uh, call the question with regard to the amended recommendation. Do we need further discussion? All right, I'll call the question. All in favor of the recommendation as amended. Um, and any against? Okay, and that is that is carried as well. Moving on to DEV 2021-26 um, is a recommendation, uh, be it resolved that, wait a minute here, let me just read this, that bylaw 2021-44 being a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw 60-2009 of the municipality of Meaford pertaining to 33 Berry Street West be taken as read a first, second and third time and finally passed. I have a mover and a seconder, please, to put that on the table. Councillor Bartley, thank you, and Councillor Kentner. Any discussion on this one? Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I have a question that's probably going to Rob in the planning department. But on page 596 of our agenda today, the con it says the conversion of an existing building even without any exterior alterations, will require a permit from Grace Sawa Conservation Area. If they did something inside a building, what does Grace Sawa Conservation Area have to do with that? Yes, Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I think what we're referring to is the change of the use in the building, which would require the additional parking based on that change of use then you're going to be doing grading, which will require the permit. So I think that's what it's referencing there. Well, yes, I, I can understand that. But it says, even without any exterior alterations, okay. would require a permit. I just didn't understand why they should get involved with an interior renovation. Thank you. Councilor Greenfield. 
Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, good question, Councillor Bartley. It, it, through you to Rob. Rob, isn't uh, even though the backyard, uh, basically the, the the parking area, is quite a level above the that of the river, isn't that on a in a hazard zone or an, an EP protection zone? Uh, if you if you go back to the great flood of 1911 or 1912, uh, and that's even before my time, uh, that entire section of the downtown was, <laughs> uh, did flow away. So uh, I, I'm just wondering if maybe there still is some kind of a, uh, a, a restriction on that, uh, on that area behind the, uh, uh, the, the residential building. Yes, uh, through your worship. So um, I think a lot of the EP for this property and the expanded EP is due to the, the slope and the erosion, the potential erosion uh, that is applicable. Uh, because it's an existing parking area, that's why the Conservation Authority has agreed to accept it. Um, and just actually back to the original comment, I think the Conservation Authority does get involved with change of uses too, because if something is, is commercial in purposes and changing to residential, it has a higher standard. So that's probably why, not that, the review is significant in regard to prohibiting the use, but they just may, may require some additional mitigation. I think that was more basis for the comments. Job. Okay, I don't see any further hands up for questions. So I will call the question then all in favor of the recommendation is presented. And that is carried. Bylaw 2021-45 is to appoint municipal law enforcement officers. Be it resolved that bylaw 2021-45 being a bylaw to appoint municipal law enforcement officers be taken as read a first, second and third time and finally passed. Can I have a mover and a seconder to put that on the table please? Councillor, yes, Deputy Mayor and Councillor Vickers, thank you. I'm just referencing that this is not, these are not new appointees that is a, a bylaw to legitimize, I guess, our law enforcement um, officers. Are there any questions for Matt on this, Councillor Vickers? Thank you, Your Worship, and, and Matt, uh, being that we aren't having, I'm assuming a lot of this came through with the paid parking uh, proposal that we we uh, decided not to go forward with, except for Memorial Park. Is there a need for two now that we're just limiting the paid parking to uh, Memorial Park? Um, thank you, Councillor Vickers. Uh, yes, um, we had uh, these additional two posts last summer as well. They were for COVID enforcement at that time and, and meant that we could properly patrol the municipality. Although we're not going to be charging for parking uh, in municipal parks, we found significant problems last year in terms of how people were parking and where people were parking. And so we do need to have that presence out in the community to be able to deal with those sorts of issues. Um, we also need to have the number that we have in order to be able to patrol Memorial appropriately and make sure that we have enough staff on. One of the things that, that's changed in the last couple of years, because it's something that neither Holly nor I was willing to accept, was that we used to have uh, one member of bylaw staff working till one o'clock in the morning on weekends at Memorial and working alone, and they would in effect be the only municipal staff member working at that time. Uh, doing it this way means that we can always have two people working. They may not be together, but they're at least in contact with each other and able to support each other when necessary. Councillor Kentner. Thank you, through your worship. Just a, a quick question to Matt. Uh, this would bring the uh, complement of bylaw officers uh, for for uh, the summer or for the year to what? So th these two are solely for the summer. Um, uh, what we have currently is our full-time manager of municipal enforcement who also covers crossing guards for us. Um, we have a, a full-time municipal law enforcement officer and now we have three temporary uh, MLEOs, including these two. The third person is not being appointed by this bylaw because she worked with us last year and, and over the winter to cover some absences. 
so that's five. So, so yes, we have for the summer period, we have five staff. Any further questions for uh, Matt? Seeing no hands raised, I'll call a question. All in favor of this recommendation as presented. And that is carried. Thank you very much. At this point, we're moving into a committee of the whole and I'm going to need a motion to extend, first of all, and then I want to know if you need a break. Thank you, Councillor Bell. A motion to extend and Councillor Greenfield, all in favor? Thank you. And do we need a break, Council? Do we want to take a, a short break? Are we good to move on for a bit? What's your pleasure? Sorry. <laughs> I do a break, Madam Mayor. Thank you. All right, um, then let's return at uh, 426 and mute your uh, video and your
Okay, welcome back everyone. So the <clears throat> first one we have to uh, look at is uh, CAO 2021-09, the uh, position recruitment update. And the recommendation reads that the Committee of the Whole recommend Council of the Municipality of Meaford advise the Joint Municipal Physician Recruitment and Retention Committee that the Municipality of Meaford is not in a position to contribute to the hiring of a physician recruiter, but wishes to continue participating with the committee on other health care matters. Can I have a mover and a seconder to put that on the table, please? Councillor Bell, Deputy Mayor. And uh, we have Janet with us, who is the author of this report. Hi, Janet, welcome. So if there's any questions for staff or <clears throat> Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And uh, certainly thank Janet for her efforts in this report. This is such a very complex and complicated issue. And uh, I appreciate all of your time, work and efforts, Your Worship, in, in being part of, uh, of this report and, and in making uh, this recommendation and for your uh, work with the uh, Retention Committee. I know it's, uh, this is challenging and it's, it's a struggle that we've been facing for many years is uh, attracting doctors, recruiting and retraining and uh, retaining and uh, healthcare in general, because it really isn't uh, the purview of the municipality, but yet we've recognized that if we don't uh, step into this ring, that uh, we're going to remain challenged for adequate numbers of healthcare professionals. So I just wanted to express my appreciation, Your Worship, for all of your efforts over the past uh, several years in, in, this, uh, in this regard. Um, so a question, I don't know if Mr. Armstrong will have the answer. We heard, uh, well, we passed some months ago, um, approval for, uh, for rezoning. And I know construction has begun for the uh, Old Gardner Wilson Funeral Home. Is there any update on when we can expect uh, those doctors to uh, open shop? Yes, thank you, um, through your worship. Um, we understand that it probably would have happened sooner, but due to COVID and their current commitments uh, where they are, they continue to work. Um, I think we have uh, a time frame of approximately nine months and they will be uh, coming to the municipality uh, to uh, set up shop in the, the old Gardner Wilson Funeral Home. Please, if I may, Your Worship. Yes, um, okay. That's good news, uh, Mr. Armstrong, thank you. So I think the question that we've always struggled with is really what is the number of our orphan patients? We did some work some time ago and established that it was around the 3,000 give or take. Um, but looking at the results of the uh, physician recruitment survey that was uh, recently undertaking um, in Meaford, it stated that 85% of residents who responded to the survey have a doctor, although the majority there'll be a large number of those who don't have a doctor in Meaford. So understanding the need here really is, uh, really is difficult. And uh, I, I appreciate the, uh, the long-term broad picture effort to really address uh, healthcare holistically, because that's, uh, that's where we need to go. And I think once our new doctors come, we can hopefully then do some kind of analysis to understand if that's enough or uh, how many more we need with the growth that's before us. We recognize that um, at least we're told that we need one doctor for every 500 new households. So if that's the case, then you know, how do we proceed with that when that time comes and where does the development community fit into, into that uh, process as we uh, continue to, uh, to recruit uh, those professionals. So as I said, it's a very complex, issue and, and uh, your worship, I look forward to uh, your comments from there. Yes, and uh, thank you for that, Deputy Mayor. Uh, you're absolutely right. It is a very, very complex uh, situation. And it has always uh, been a concern of, uh, of mine that um, 
we really don't have any um, influence over the hiring of doctors within our community. Um, as with economic development, I think it is all it is a um, a, a responsibility and an opportunity for a council and the municipality to create the kind of environment that will attract not only new business, but also um, physicians. And of course, they operate their own businesses as well. So looking at and um, working with through our um, uh, community safety and well-being plan, um, has just put a, a real focus on wellness and how better we can perhaps support our local physicians um, by uh, advocating if that's uh, if that's the way we can if we can do it this way for an increase and in support for um, allied professions that are going to expand the reach of our local physicians. Um, to uh, you know, the, to roster as many patients as we can, um, but also to focus on uh, a, a wellness perspective and keeping people healthy and keeping people away from sickness and, and hospitals. And I think uh, that is a way that, um, and we have been recognized quite honestly uh, with this work um, from the Rural Ontario uh, Medical uh, Program ROMP for short, and uh, uh, that has been recruiting uh, uh, and uh, training um, physicians, new residents from uh, for this area. They bring in about 83 new residents uh, every year for training purposes. And uh, they have recognized the work that has been going on here in our community to focus on health and wellness and this as an alternative, not an alternative to doctors because doctors are, are critical uh, for healthcare in our communities. But this is a way that we as a municipality can support that effort um, and, and to um, through the, the lens of community health and welfare. We also have a, a physician recruiter within our Grey Bruce Health Systems um, that recruits for our family of, of uh, uh, hospital sites. And um, the resources that uh, are her uh, disposal are um, there for uh, physician recruiters to, to attract new residents coming in as well. And we've had a, a, a very good example of, I think, the best way to recruit new physicians into our community when one of our local doctors is going to be uh, leaving us, and um, through the collegial uh, working of the other physicians within the group, um, one the one of the re residents that was uh, uh, coming in for a temporary duty and a locum situation was invited to attend and to become a part of uh, the local working group and to take over this um, exiting physician's uh, roster of patients. And I think that's where uh, it is, we're going to see more recruitment happening. And I know that this is a particular, um, uh, I guess, method of operating uh, by our new physician that is going to be opening up the new clinic coming into the area as well. Um, he's a teacher, and uh, and that is the way that uh, that he prefers to work by word of mouth and by recruiting through locums and through residential um, training program. So I think we we are in a very advantageous position right now. Um, we have many things uh, that are contributing to the the uh, health and wellness uh, focus that is going to be critical for. Um, new residents to come in and, and practice. We also have the only attainable housing project that is underway at the moment within Southern Georgian Bay. And uh, attainable housing is something that new physicians coming into the area um, are certainly going to be very interested in. They, they will be needing a uh, uh, to start uh, a, you know entry into the home ownership program as well. So we have a number of things on our uh, worksheet that uh, contrib will contribute to this being a very desirable um, location uh, for new physicians to come in and join the practice. 
But in the meantime, if we can uh, stay connected to our colleagues throughout Southern Georgian Bay area, our other uh, similar municipalities with similar concerns, um, we can then be a collective voice for the promotion and for the advocacy of expanding our healthcare um, allied uh, uh, professionals to support that uh, physicians that we all need. Um, I think, uh, I don't know that I have anything more to say on that. I did um, circulate some, my thoughts on this to council. I'm happy to answer any questions if uh, you have any for anything further. Councillor Greenfield. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, through you uh, to uh, uh, Janet, um, I'm uh, I'm quite happy to uh, uh, to endorse this recommendation as it has been presented. I uh, uh, I'm quite satisfied with what uh, what has transpired. But uh, Janet, uh, it's is is this group only interested in going out and hiring doctors? Has there been conversation about? Uh, preventive medicine, uh, about nurse practitioners, uh, uh, more nurse practitioners offering more, uh, uh, more treatment for uh, a, a great many problems. Uh, certainly as far as prevention is concerned, we're all getting tired of wearing your mask and keep your distance, but uh, there's so much more to preventive medicine. And uh, um, uh, I, other than the, the COVID problems, I, ha I haven't heard much uh, lately. There, there are other uh, medical factors, but in particular, nurse pr practitioners, I just think there is uh, there's a huge void that uh, you know, these good folks could uh, could fill, and I'm wondering if uh, if they're being uh, discussed. Uh, Janet, do you want to respond to that? <laughs> Sorry, yes. Um, through your worship to Councillor Greenfield, thanks for the question. And I apologize, my internet's a little bit unstable, so hopefully I don't break up or cut out. Um, the, this committee, the, the Joint uh, Physician Recruitment Committee, has been primarily focused on physician recruitment. They have talked about other things like nurse practitioners and that, but the the primary piece that they've been working on right now is the, the physician recruitment piece as the fundamental of how they move forward with that and getting a recruiter in place for that. Um, the nurse practitioner, the survey that they just did that deputy mayor had spoken to, it did have some questions in there about the nurse practitioner. And, and certainly there's been some discussions that committee has brought in um, lots of great speakers, such as, you know, Paul Hoban from the family health team, who's provided some pretty good insight on the value of nurse practitioners and what they bring uh, to physicians to support them and those added services too that come in. And a lot of physicians coming in, they, um, you know, they like joining that, that family health team because it provides that added supportive services for them. But obviously that's also a, a funding piece uh, and challenge for um, how that gets set up and how it gets uh, funded and paid for. So. Uh, certainly, it's it's part of the discussion, but the primary has been for a physician recruiter at this time. Thank you. Thank you for that. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And I just wanted to uh, make Council aware that I will share this report with the Northeast Gray uh, Health Centers Board because I am uh, your member on that board. Um, but a question for you, uh, Janet, if I may. Some years ago, there was a, uh, a METRA profile done and, and there was um, some addendums to that and there was one prepared for doctors. And I'm wondering, I know you have not got any spare time whatsoever, but if there was any potential of sort of updating that document um, to reflect uh, the mayor's comments of what's available now in METRA that may be attractive to uh, any doctors considering our area. Through your worship to Deputy Mayor. Uh, yes, we, I think we updated the community profile. I think it was 2017 when this one was last done. Mm -hmm. um, and that is certainly on the radar for me to want to update because that has obviously economic development uh, benefits to having that developed. And, and so we can look at the physician piece to that too. I think the biggest thing that we're learning through 
um, the advocacy and the discussions that we're having with all of our healthcare stakeholders is that communication is a really good uh, field and area that we can be within to support in physician recruitment. And, you know, a lot of doctors that are coming in, like we, we hear that there's great value in, in, in and benefit to coming to this area. And, um, you know, the physicians coming in, this is what they want to know is, is how do they connect with the community? How do they be a part of it? What kind of things are offered and available? And certainly, I think that would be a really important part to be able to connect in with that profile and that, that piece to be able to communicate to physicians and support in their decision making. Thank you, Janet. <clears throat> Anything further? Okay, then I will call the question. All in favor of uh, receiving this report, this recommendation, it's presented. Any, all in favor, that, and that is carried unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to COR 2021-30, uh, tax rates and um, tax ratios. The recommendation reads that the Committee of the Whole recommend Council of the Municipality Meaford enact a bylaw to adopt the 2021 tax rates, establish the due dates and to further provide for penalty and interest in default of payment thereof for 2021. And uh, number two, enact a bylaw to opt out of the vacant unit rebate program under section 364 of the Municipal Act 2001. I have a move and a seconder please to put that on the table. Councillor Kentner, Councillor Greenfield. Okay, and um, any questions for Rob or uh, Darcy on this one? Councillor Kentner and then Councillor Bartley. Uh, thank you, through your worship. I just want to be really clear that uh, by passing this, we are uh, voting to opt out of the vacant unit rate uh, um, in our municipality. Is that correct? I, and I, I've supported that for a long time, and I think it's uh, uh, really important. We want to see our, uh, our storefronts on Sykes Street filled. And I think this is a, a move in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I guess this would be to Mr. Chapman. So during budget deliberations, we passed a uh, an increase of three, I think 3.43%. Combined with the uh, county and the education, it should come down to 2.5% increase. But because of increase in assessment, which I thought I was always under the impression when our assessment went up, we reduced our mill rate so that it was a, a break even point. But because of increased assessment, our blended rate is now going to be 4.06%. Is that not like double dipping, Mr. Treasurer? Uh, so your worship, sorry, where where do you get the 2.3%? Well, uh, we agreed on a 3.43, did we not, on the municipal level? That's correct. And then you combine that with the county at 2% and the education, it should meld out at 2.57. Is that close? Oh, Without I, assessment. Yeah, I, I couldn't say exactly what, what it is, but it's probably somewhere around there. The reality is, though, is that we do a net neutral asset or a net neutral tax rate. But the problem is that there are shifts within the overall tax class where one class moves up or down more than the other. It can have other effects. So the, the rate was revenue neutral overall across all, all assessment within the municipality. However, other assessment within the municipality went up less than the residential component of the assessment. And therefore, that's why there's uh, the increase in this, because not only did, um, like, if, if the property, the, the residential property had stayed at $268,300, the same as it was in 2020, you would have only seen that 2.57% or whatever that number was that you calculated somewhere around there, the 2.5% blended. But because that there was also an assessment increase and the residential went up more than the rest, then there is an impact on that as well. 
because it's not just about residential assessment, it's about all tax assessments within all the classes. I do have to also say uh, one thing. Um, th these rates will be adjusted slightly because uh, on Thursday, as part of the passage of the county bylaw, the county recognized that there was um, an error within the, their calculations that, that they had originally provided and they've been updated. So the, the rates will be adjusted uh, to reflect that change. Up or down? Uh, I believe it, their rate will go down slightly. I, I just, I thought I had a real grasp on taxation in the municipality. And when we approve a rate and it should be 2.57 and now everybody, everybody's going to see a 4.06% increase. I just felt that's double dipping and I don't think I'll ever understand it. Sorry, I, I think we, there's two different things here. You, you, you passed a budget that had a budget increase of three and a half percent. You did not pass a rate increase of three and a half percent. There are two different things. So that's why, uh, you know, it's in, there is a difference between the two of these. Okay, good. Deputy Mayor, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Worship, and thank you, Mr. Chapman. I have to think about that. But I'm wondering if you're able to give Council any uh, suggestion of what the impact is of removing the vacancy rate for us off the top of your head, what uh, impact will that have on us? $4,000. Is that total? $4,000? That's, That's total. I, I believe I've noted this a number of times in the past that the property has to be vacant for six months. For six months. They have to actively be marketing the property for rent and show that through their application. And it's on an annual basis that they apply. So, and it's only 30% of the taxes that they actually get forgiven or written off, let's call it. So it's only a handful of properties that ever apply for this and it's not the same properties and it's never the properties that council wants actively marketed at downtown storefront. That developer does not apply for this program because he owns the property, he pays all the taxes because he's not actively trying to market the property. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't get rid of this. Many municipalities are, everybody across the county is going to do this because we've all been pressuring Gray County to, to get this program put in place. But this is not going to have consequential economic impact that maybe people might perceive. Any further comments? Okay, I see no further hands raised with comments or questions. So I'll call the question. All in favor of the recommendation as presented? Two, three, and those against? Any against? That is carried, thank you. COR 2021-31 is an update on the 4th Canadian Division Training Centre Payment in Lieu of Taxes Appeal. The recommendation is that the Committee of the Whole recommend Council of the Municipality of Mayford number one, allocate the payment in lieu of taxes settlement to the following projects to be included in the 2022 budget. First is a, a future aerial truck purchase for $500,000. The second is a transportation master plan implementation for $400,000. The well-being plan implementation, $100,000. Solar installation for $140,000. The Smith Tire parking lot rehabilitation, $125,000 and $500,000. Uh, Harbor master plan implementation, $400,000. And number two, 
direct the mayor to send a letter to the Minister of National Defense, Harjit Sajan, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Jonathan Wilkinson, and Bruce Gray Owen Sound MP, Alex Ruff, requiring a full disclosure uh, to the public regarding contamination on the 4th Canadian Division Training Centre lands, and further that the greater public have an opportunity to understand the 25 year plans to remediate the site. I have a mover and a seconder please to put that on the table, Councillor Kentner. And I need a seconder please. Councillor Vickers, thank you. <clears throat> Questions for Darcy? Count, uh, Deputy Mayor and Councillor Kentner, Councillor Bartley. Um, thank you, Your Worship. I have uh, two questions, so if, if you want to okay. come back to me, that's fine. Um, first one, um, so we recognize the split that uh, 1,006,000, 6,500, if I add correctly, comes to Meaford and 370,000 to Gray County. So I'm wondering how Council feels. Um, when the Town of Blue Mountains discovered some uh, supplemental assessment uh, last year, they came to County Council and requested that uh, Council allocate those funds back to Town of the Blue Mountains in support of uh, affordable housing. So I'm wondering, since we heard Darcy in particular really did the heavy lifting here, if we might make a similar request to Gray County for their portion of the funds to put towards um, um, I don't know if we could put it towards affordable housing, but if we could put it towards a project that uh, fits in with uh, the county strategic initiatives, if uh, you have any comment on that, Darcy. No. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I guess it's a question more for council to direct uh, the county representatives to ask that. Yeah, we'd have to discuss the case for that, I think, Your Worship, and whether uh, we, we had something solid that we could take to County Council, but I thought we should talk about it. Uh, sorry, it counts. Uh, I, yeah. I think, Madam Mayor, maybe the best way of dealing with this is if we treat uh, Deputy Mayor's comments as a notice of motion, and, and perhaps the Deputy Mayor and I can, can work on some words for Council for the next meeting, and then you, you specifically talk about that at the next meeting, and then can deal with the rest of this report today. That sounds like a reasonable um, alternative. Thank you, Matt. Are you happy with that, Deputy Mayor? Uh, yes, Your Worship. Sure. Moving forward, a, a notice of motion. Well, we'll we will uh, bring that back up again later on in the agenda. Thanks. Okay, and you had a second question. Um, yes, um, for Mr. Uh, Armstrong. Um, and I know we talked briefly about this, Rob, but just the thought of uh, breaking down this. Fund because it's a substantial amount of money that Meaford doesn't usually get to uh, allocate. And uh, I know my initial thought was when we first heard about this, let's put it all towards one great big project. And the first thought that came to my mind was, was a new pool. So I just wonder, Mr. Armstrong, if you could speak to council and the public with any thoughts on uh, plans for a go forward with, with a new pool and, and why that doesn't fit with this uh, potential pot of money. Yeah, I, I can start and I'm sure Darcy will expand on it based on the, the asset side of it and, and just the parks and rec master plan side of it. So I personally, and I think I shared with you, Deputy Mayor, uh, was that I think that type of commitment is premature because we need to consider the long-term aspects of are we going to potentially have a partnership for a pool that could be used for a longer period of time, I, an indoor pool in partnership with someone year round. And I think it's quite a few years out for that type of, of venture. Or if we're not doing that, we really need to investigate what our long-term is. And I think it's premature for us uh, at this point in time to be considering uh, that aspect. Um, and that's why I think we put the projects that we feel they're the, the more immediate ones that require attention. Um, they're based on plans now and, uh, and should be considered at this point in time. So I don't know if you have anything more to add to that, Darcy, or no, okay. Okay. 
Thanks for that, Rob. And I'll put you on the list, Tony, but uh, Councillor Kentner is next. Thank you. Through your worship, uh, I would just like to uh, uh, applaud Darcy for the preparation uh, for the hearing, uh, his performance at the hearing, and, uh, and also for calling out DND on the environmental issues. Uh, I just uh, really applaud the job that uh, you did, and uh, I think we, I speak for all of us when I say how much we appreciate it. Very true. Thank you for that. And Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, same same thing to Darcy. Darcy, this kind of came around due to you, and I thank you very much. Now, item F, the Harbor Plan Master Master Plan Implementation. You, uh, we don't have enough money to do what it says in the the actual plan. What are you going to do with the 400,000 for phase three and four. Can you let us in on that? Or we just started the, you know, detailed work on phase three and four that was approved in uh, the 2021 budget. So we've got a consultant working on it and we'll be going through all the public consultation over the next three or four months to come up with a plan. Uh, so some of this can be implemented in 2022, 2022 budget and moving forward. Ultimately, though, I mean, phase three or, or areas three and four are the areas all around the pavilion or the folks who are playing pickleball right now, kind of the waterfront area and the parking. So, I mean, I think $400,000, like the, the, the old plan, like the 2014 document showed, you know, it's needing, you know, 800000 to a million dollars. So I think it's really... Uh, whatever the priorities are, the way that we structured this with the consultant was to look at uh, phase four uh, independent of phase three. And then further, we looked at phase three in two different areas. We split that area up into an A and a B, specifically to allow us some flexibility when it came to budget time. So if we didn't have all the money in one go, then we didn't have to wait for forever to start implementing something. So I really couldn't tell you. I mean, the easy... Um, you know, thing right now is to say we could easily spend four hundred thousand dollars dealing with all of the drainage and paving the parking lot and doing everything up properly when it comes to parking and drainage and everything. Whether there's any money left after that, I don't know. And whether that really should even be the priority project, I'm not too sure. But that's certainly one option that would be out there. Thank you. And Councillor Bell. Uh, thanks, Madam Mayor and to Darcy. So in your report, it says about having uh, public or uh, in contacting uh, the, the MP in our writing um, about environmental issues and, and cleanup on the base. Um, I, I really have a concern with the Department of National Defense and the military where they have impact zones and they've had those impact zones since the uh, Second World War. And I mean, the military has got to have a plan for for cleaning up these areas and uh, or their continued use for the next number of years. So I need you to expand on, on why we need to have public engagement on, on what the DND is doing up on the 4th Canadian Division Training Center and why it's important that we include that um, in this report that you have. Do you know what they're doing up there to remediate the land? I know, I know that when uh, the uh, small arms are used, I know that they are very conscious of uh, any of the, I'm just gonna say the brass or the clips and things like that. I also am very aware that when they park their vehicles uh, as an environmentally conscious organization, you can't park a vehicle without putting a pad underneath the differential or underneath the engine. And I know that they don't allow the troops uh, to just to go into the bush and just do bush business on a personal level that, you know, they have Johnny on the spots. So the environment is important to the DND. And so those are just some of the things that I, I have picked up along the way with my involvement in uh, the area that I have. So, you know, I'm just asking what, what the heavier things are that you might be aware of that, that I am not. Well, I think the report's pretty clear that it talks about the fact that there's give or take 6,500 acres of land, which is fully fenced off, that even the troops aren't supposed to be or allowed to go into. 
because it was used for, um, you know, dud and non dud producing ammunition for a long period of time that there is a lot of potential. The military says that there's a lot of unexploded ordinances. There is a white phosphorus zone. Uh, a portion of it's within their mapping is shown within the wetlands of uh, Mountain Lake. I mean, uh, as somebody who lives in Silcote, it's pretty darn close to uh, the, the border of the, the training center and all of the water that hits the DND land, all 19,000 acres, eventually hits creeks and streams and water courses that either run onto private lands and, you know, might find farms close to your house or ultimately gets out into Georgian Bay. So, uh, I mean, they made it pretty clear through the, the information that they released as part of the, the, the overall case that they said that there is significant contamination on the land. I can't find significant contamination in any public documentation. The report suggests that there is a requirement that any lands that are federally owned or used that have contamination are supposed to be shown on the Treasury Board Secretariat website to fully disclose to the Canadian public what the contamination is. So, I mean, e either there isn't contamination and that was just a bluff as part of the overall court proceedings, which I highly doubt the federal government's going to try and bluff little old Meaford, or there really is significant contamination and they're not being fully transparent to the Canadian public. And I mean, the public at large should know what's going on, but certainly folks who live in the municipality of Meaford who access and use Georgian Bay or who get their water sources from wells and, and, and creeks and streams should know what kind of contamination is happening on that land. You've given a very good uh, answer, uh, Mr. Chapman. I uh, definitely appreciate that. Okay, Councillor Vickers and then Councillor Bartley and Councillor Greenfield. Thank you, Your Worship. And, uh, and I guess my comment towards, uh, towards the report is, you know, I, I'm very happy that we, we came to this settlement and, and got the conclusion that we have. Um, I guess I'm, I'm a little concerned about, uh, you know, in all the different areas that we're allocating the funds to. Um, I, I guess I'm maybe a little bit slower in, in, uh, in letting the money go back out. Um, you know, I can, I can accept a couple of these ones, you know, C and E, or I think are two very high priorities that we, that we have. And, uh, and I, just, I just question maybe not just banking some of this money for the time being as opposed to putting it into the six different areas. And, uh, um, you know, I, I'm sure they're, they're worthy. I just, uh, I feel a little cautious about, uh, about allocating all these funds in, in the six different ways. Uh, I, I don't have any problems with the, with the C and the E, uh, but just the other four, I guess I'm you know, just, it was, uh, once you spend capital, you can't spend it the second time. So I'm just a little cautious on that. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, I do appreciate where this money's going to and, and pretty well all of them would save us money in the future once we've spent this and we don't have to spend it again on these items. I'm a little concerned that the whole allotment is going to the urban uh, center, none to the uh, rural. And I thought a chunk of money should either go towards a bridge uh, out in the country. So that's that's where my hesitation is. 100% of this is for urban. Thank you. Through your worship, um, I guess to try and comment on both Councillor Vickers and Councillor Bartley. Please. So as, staff, as staff, we came up with suggestions to use the funds based on we thought was most appropriate based on all of the strategic priorities and master plans that council has recently adopted, which um, I know if you've, if council has accepted them as guiding documents to move forward, you know, there's a recognition that you actually probably want to move these forward. Uh, so uh, literally everything from 
B through F hits one of those documents. The only thing that doesn't is the fire truck, uh, which in reality, I mean, to Councillor Bartley's point, is kind of rural because the point that we're purchasing it is to be able to assist the Fourth Canadian Division Training Center should they actually have a fire. Uh, you know, it, it could also be used in large barn fires and everything else in between, depending on how the the municipality deploys. Uh, ultimately, though, th this is was a discussion point for council to start. If you want to bank the money, if you want to put it to a different project, uh, then so be it. But uh, you know, the reality here is that this is found money. It is one-time money. Uh, we're not going to get this again. So, from staff's perspective, you know. It, trying to be strategic about everything, the intention was to split this up into a whole bunch of different areas to actually make some headway on a bunch of plans that have been sitting stagnant for, in some cases, you know, more than a handful of years with zero investment in them to try and start to expedite some of council's priorities. But you have the ability to make whatever change you'd like to make. This was just a starting point. And Councillor uh, Greenfield is next, and Councillor Kentner. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I do have some uh, some questions, actually, about A, D, and E. Uh, the uh, uh, questions from Mr. Chapman. One of the places for solar installation, you mentioned the Mifa Museum. Now, is I, I'm assuming that's on the the newer part of the museum. I I wondered uh, the uh, the roof on the old pump house is it uh, is it a candidate for an installation or is it the uh, the more recent addition onto the museum? Through uh, your worship, the roof was just replaced last year, the year before, I believe. So it. Uh, with the steel roof. So, I mean, it makes a great candidate for uh, long-term solar installation because we don't have to worry about an old roof having to be replaced with solar on it. Okay, thank you for that. If I may, um, quickly, the Smith Tire parking lot. Now, that 125, that has nothing to do with the demolition of the current building. That's over and above that. Through your worship, that's correct. We had money allocated in the 2021 budget uh, to do the demolition. That will happen here in the month of June. Uh, and then uh, because the tender came in favorable, there's actually enough money uh, sitting in the, the project budget to allow us to start doing the design and engineering of the parking lot with the stormwater management plan that, that would have to be done for that area. So we're gonna, we've already planned on starting that this year after demolition because there was money available to do so. So this 125 grand would actually be to implement that plan and to fully um, you know, put in a parking lot. Okay, th thank you. And if I may, just quickly, the um, the 500,000 for the, uh, the the fire truck uh, is that uh, indicating that we're going to go for uh, a brand new aerial truck as opposed to uh, maybe a less expensive uh, one that might be a few years old? Um, Madam Mayor, perhaps I can answer that one. Um, yes, uh, the, the plan for a number of years now that's been included in Council's budget documents as part of the 10-year capital plan has been to replace the existing second-hand aerial that, that we were fortunate enough to purchase last year and replace one of the pumpers with, with a combined unit that's generally called a quint. Um, this means that we get, in effect, two vehicles for the price of one. Um, and then we, so we would do that on, on a new basis. I think the other thing that's really important to say about the, the fire situation is that we have in the long-term capital budget money allocated to reserve every year to pay for a new aerial. We do not have any money in the capital budget at all allocated to pay for other replacement equipment that we will need at some stage. You know, All of those vehicles in the fire hall will need to be replaced at some point in the next 20 to 25 years. And right now we're not putting aside any money for that at all. So dealing with uh, the fire truck in this way. And as the report says, this is one of the very few services we actually provide to the base and they require us to have an aerial truck. Um, this seems to be a, a good way of getting ahead of this so that we've got some money to pay for it when we need to and then can start putting money away for the other vehicle replacements over time. 
Thank you, Matt. Okay, uh, Councillor Kentner, you're next. Uh, thank you, Through Your Worship. I, I really didn't have any uh, problem uh, with, with uh, any of the, uh, the recommendations. Uh, that they're, they're all valid and good, but I would not have a problem supporting if uh, Councillor Vickers wants to make a motion to, uh, you know, bank some of this. Uh, I, I mean, we can make these decisions any time. And I think there is a lot of merit in holding back some of this. And so if he's interested in making a, a motion, I, I'd be prepared to second it. Okay, thank you. Councillor Pickers. So through your worship, so I'd like to make an amendment that we accept the report uh, with the, uh, with projects C and E being included and excluding A, B, D and F and have that put into a reserve fund. I don't know whether I worded that very well, not, but uh, maybe you um, can help me out with that one. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor, because it gets me three quarters of the way there. Uh, the question that I know the Treasurer will ask is, which reserve are you directing him to transfer money into? Because there are many. So just to make uh, the Treasurer's life a little bit easier, could we start a new reserve saying, uh, or do you have to distinguish a, a uh, end use of the reserve, or can you put it just kind of in the bank saying this is the D and D uh, settlement reserve? Is that possible, or do you have to have a, an end use to it named? Uh, so, Your Worship, if we're going to put it into a reserve, um, and you want ultimate flexibility, the easiest is to throw it into the working capital reserve because uh, it's just a reserve and it's just working capital. Um, if you want it to garner interest and you want it to be put into a reserve fund, uh, we would actually need, if you want it to be a new reserve fund, we need to have a bylaw passed and that bylaw needs to dictate where the money is going to be spent. So, I mean, if it's, a, if it's a matter of, um, kind of giving the thumbs up to approve C and E in the 2022 budget, but then leaving the rest of the money still for those same projects, but just holding off on implementing any of them. My suggestion would be that like the $500,000 still goes to the fire reserve, $400,000 to the road reserve, you know, $140,000 to facilities, $400,000 to the harbor, you know, that, you know what I mean, to those reserve funds, mm -hmm. it's specific for those purposes. Uh, if you want to leave it um, very kind of um, bland, uh, and vague, then just put it into the working capital reserve. It would be my wish to put it in the general working uh, reserve fund. That would be okay. My... So, so I have some words then for you, Councillor Vickers, and see whether you, you like these. <clears> that the motion be amended by removing items 1A, 1B, 1D, and 1F, and to add an additional clause to say, Three, direct the treasurer to transfer the balance of the settlement to the working capital reserve. Yes, I would agree with that. Okay. So there's um, that motion has been put forward by uh, Councillor Vickers and uh, Councillor Kentner, you would like to Second that. All right. Um, are, are there any further questions before I call the question? Then uh, over to you, then, Mayor, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Just a question for Mr. Chapman. So, if for argument's sake we adopted the recommendations as they are before us, would the funds not sit in that reserve until you were ready to draw them out for projects anyway? Uh, Three worship, that is true, yes. Uh, we would put all these different monies into those reserve funds in 2021, and they wouldn't be drawn out until at least 2022 or later, depending on the implementation of the project. But they would go to those specific reserve funds and then therefore be allocated effectively to those purposes. This report 
uh, would be backing to that to say that not only would they go into that reserve fund, but that they should be used specifically for the implementation of these specific projects versus Councillor Vickers request, which is more um, just kind of leave it in the piggy bank and don't allocate it to anything. And if I may, Your Worship, you would come back to us, Mr. Chapman, or the appropriate department at the time of implementation for argument's sake of the transportation master plan and say this is a project we're considering. Your Worship, no, I wouldn't. I would, I would uh, expect that council has an understanding, you know, that there would be $1.4 million sitting in the working capital reserve fund or the working capital reserve and uh, as such, it will be Council's prerogative whenever projects come forward or whenever we're working on capital to suggest projects that should be funded from that pot of money. I mean, this is, this is staff saying that, that our recommendation based on the strategic priorities and plans that Council has adopted, these are the projects that you should use this money for. This is our professional recommendation. If council doesn't like this because you have other ideas, I'm absolutely fine with that. But then it's up to council to bring forward those ideas, not staff. Because you know what we'll bring forward is simply funding projects that are contained within these strategic plans and master plans that you've already approved. Because that's the direction that you've given us. Dorothy, I would be uh, interested to hear the uh, comments on uh, the Harbor Master Plan implementation. Um, that has been sitting um, for quite some time without any action on it. And with the potential for a uh, development that will border onto that, um, uh, that facility, and I'm just wondering um, how, what the timing would be in, in moving ahead with uh, the implementation of the Mar uh, Harbor Master Plan? How quickly could that get underway? Uh, it, it all depends on council's desires to allocate money through the budget mm -hmm. annually. I mean, this is, uh, this is effectively an enhancement, you know, whenever we get to budget time, right? Because it's not part of roads or bridges core facilities or fleet. That's what we're funding right now. That's right. it. So that's why all of these master plans are sitting, you know, collecting dust because we don't have the financial capacity to fund these things. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's why as staff, um, you know, we thought that, uh, I, I appreciate the deputy mayor suggesting the pool, to, uh, you know, one project that's certainly not a bad project to, to spend the 1.7 on, um, but, whether spending it on one thing or spending it on a multitude of things is the right direction. Again, that's for council to sit here and debate. Thank you. Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, I have to semi agree with Councillor Vickers um, with what we approved earlier on in this uh, meeting with extra staff. We're not going to have extra money to carry on with the Harbor Master Plan. I'd like to, definitely I would like to, but I don't think we would. And I could agree with Councillor Vickers if he includes A. I think A is absolutely a must. We must put money away for a fire truck. We took it away from the budget last year, the $100,000. It's going to hit us in the face very shortly and we're going to be sitting there with our hands out. So I think A should be included in your uh, submission, Councillor Vickers. <laughs> uh, for you, Madam Mayor, we can have an amendment to the amendment if Councillor Bart Bartley so wishes. Councillor Vickers? Uh, uh, to, uh, to talk to Councillor Bartley's uh, point, I guess I'm, I'm still wondering whether we need that much money put in the reserve for the aerial truck that if we couldn't find one that uh, is used, uh, that wouldn't quite have the same price tag on as, uh, as you know, but the goal is of maybe funding a, a brand new aerial truck. I just, uh, I struggle looking at how often it would get used in the municipality and to, to tie up that much capital, um, I'm, I'm struggling with it. Steve, I'll, 
that's my that's my reason. Matt? If I could, Madam Mayor, just just to say that because we've had a comment about the rural and, and Councillor Vickers comment about how often it's used. It's actually now used quite a lot. Um, we've, we've had a bit of a model uh, change in, in dispatch model over the last uh, year or so. And, and while the chief is not here today to, to correct me if I'm wrong, hopefully I'm getting this correct. And the, the, the big change is that now that aerial truck is going out to every rural event. And, and quite coincidentally, we're talking about this, as, as you've talked about barns at the start of this meeting, there are an awful lot of barns that are taller than, than our highest buildings in the urban area. So, so that aerial truck is, is really important for those. It's also now, and this is definitely something brand new from the start of the year, being dispatched to every fire within the ITFD coverage area. Because, and that's being done on a mutual aid basis by agreement between the two chiefs. Um, because again, ITFD have recognized that they don't have a, an aerial and, and MIFID does. So when there's those big occurrences and uh, we can actually provide that piece of equipment and, and assist on those scenes as well. So, so we are actually using those aerials quite frequently. Uh, and as I say, it is, it is part of the, the requirements of, of the base as well that we, we have that ability to have an aerial truck go. So we will always have to have one, uh, whether that be a, of a new one or, or a used one. As I mentioned earlier, our thought has always been that if we get a new one, that means we'll we'll do it as a combined unit to reduce the total number of vehicles in our fleet as, as a cost cutting measure, but still be able to provide uh, that sort of service. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, if, I, if I could, I just, wanna, I just wanna step into the kind of, um, you know, enforce what Matt's saying. First, let me say, I struggle with over a million dollars for this piece of equipment as well as the treasurer. It's a, it's a lot of money. It's a big ticket item for, a, you know, a mostly rural, semi-urban kind of municipality that we are. The issue is, though, is that we have to have an aerial truck. You're not going to find an aerial truck out there that is four or five years old for, you know, a half or a third of the price because the way that, because these things are so expensive and in urban areas, like real urban areas, like, you know, a city of Toronto, they only keep them for 10 years because they've actually wore them out after 10 years, right? For places like the city of Owen Sound, they keep them for the 15 years because after 15 years, they need to get rid of them because they can't be considered a frontline truck anymore because of the NFPA standards. So we're never going to buy something that is used that is high quality. The best that we're going to be able to do is, you know, a couple of years from now, go out and take a flyer and spend another hundred thousand dollars on something that's 10 to 15 years old and cross our fingers and hope that we bought, you know, the rose and not the lemon. So, you know, this is one of these pieces of equipment that it's a high ticket value, but we really can't get away from. The advantage of the plan is also to take two vehicles and turn them into one so we can get rid of a pumper truck you know, which is a $300,000, $350,000 expense and just incorporate it into this ladder truck. And then that would become a vehicle that gets deployed all of the time, not some of the time. Councilor Bartley. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And just a clarification to Matt or Darcy, are you telling me if we bought a million dollar ladder truck after 15 years, we can't legally use it? No, that's not what we're saying. The, the NFPA guidelines say that vehicles should only be frontline vehicles for up to 15 years. Uh, clearly, MIFID has had vehicles for many, many more years than that. Uh, other departments do treat those guidelines as, as gospel and as things that they must abide by. Okay, so having said that, uh, this isn't replacing a truck. This money would replace two trucks. We have two trucks, like Matt says, and the truck that you're talking about that does dual purpose, there's none of them out there used, correct? Uh, not particularly to the best of my knowledge because they're a relatively new thing for, for communities like ours. Um, so I think they'd be much harder to find. And having said that, my last statement on it is the 500,000 would go in to a, a, a reserve fund for a, an aerial truck it could go to a used truck in two or three years if that's what we decided or when we get the money for a new one. I, I still think the money should be there because um, we cut that out of the budget last year, the 100000 Thank you. 
Well, uh, Councillor Vickers. Thank you, Your Worship. It's uh, it's going to be a long afternoon, isn't it? So uh, I would like to make my amendment, and if uh, Councillor Kentner would agree to it, then I guess we can drive on to include A, C, and E uh, going towards those uh, those specific. Uh, if, um, no, I'm getting tired. Uh, budget items, and then uh, put in general reserves uh, of the total of B. D and F, which would be 940,000. I think by doing my math quickly. 940, that's right. 940 in general reserves. So with the, the seconders agreement, then I'll just remove one A from the text that I read previously. I agree. <clears throat> okay, so so Madam Mayor, I, I, I don't know if there's any more conversation, but just so everybody's on the same page, the motion that's on the floor now would be that the motion be amended by removing items 1B, 1D, 1F, and adding an additional clause to say three, direct the treasurer to transfer the balance of the settlement to the working capital reserve. Okay, thank you for that, Matt. And I don't see any further discussion on this. So I will call the question. All in favor of the amendment as presented? Two, three, four, five, that is carried. Those, those against? Yes. Okay, that is carried. And so now we'll take the uh, call the question for the amended recommendation. Any further discussion on that? Okay, all in favor of the recommended? Okay, and those against? And that is carried as well. Thank you very much. COR 2021-32 is a recommendation that Committee of the Whole receive report COR 2021-32, a facility needs study project outline for information purposes. The mover and a seconder, please, to put that on the table. Uh, Councillor Greenfield, Deputy Mayor, thank you. Any comments, questions on this one? I see no questions at this point, Darcy. Uh, three worships, if there's no questions, I just want to make it, uh, I want to make sure the council is aware of this because we've kind of went down the rabbit hole a couple of times on different master plans and projects where, you know, we get to the final end result and council, um, you know, feels almost like they're side swiped by not knowing what the end result was going to be or what, what the intent was. So, I just want counts because, you know, this is almost a, re you know, kind of a reflection of what happened earlier today with regards to the transportation master plan, right? And, mm -hmm. and you know, some of council not really liking what the end result was. So if council approves this, we're going to move forward looking at all of the facilities. We need to recognize, though, that at no point in time is anybody ever going to say that we should get rid of the arena or that we're going to get rid of Meaford Hall, right? But there are a number of small facilities which might be up for significant discussion. I mean, somebody might come back with a recommendation that instead of actually having to replace washrooms at $150,000 at the Ann and Ballpark, that we just demolish those washrooms and go back to Porta Potty, right? Or that one, two, or potentially all three of the rural community centers, because of use and cost, should just be sold. Or that there are a bunch of facilities which we own that other organizations use, but they don't actually serve a municipal purpose, that we should be disposing of those facilities. So if council, I want council to be 
you know, acutely aware of what the potential outcomes might be right here and right now so that you're either okay with what those outcomes might be or tell us that you're not so that we don't waste time and effort and money to come up with a solution that council is not going to be able to accept. Because these are the things that, you know, most likely are going to come out of this plan. I'm not saying that they all are, but there's probably going to be recommendations for low use facilities, small community facilities, rural facilities to be disposed of, or only to use for the next five to 10 years, whatever the remaining life cycle is, and then demolished at that stage of the game. So, you know, I think council should have that discussion right now, if you're okay with it, or if you're not okay with it, and not just you know, moving on to the next report, because this is going to have significant impacts eight months from now when you see the final outcome of this. Councillor Kentner, Councillor Bartley. Uh, thank you through your worship and thank you, Darcy. Uh, I, I certainly, uh, in reading the report, uh, cannot agree to the, uh, the funding gaps that are, that are mentioned throughout. I mean, uh, uh, we've maintained our facilities uh, pretty well uh, over a long period of time. We, we have probably have more than we need, but at, uh, I, I just thought re reading the report, the funding gaps were uh, quite ludicrous really, and uh, we would never afford to be able to maintain everything we have uh, to the degree that uh, it seems uh, these uh, assessments specify. Sorry, Madam Mayor, I just want clarification. Is Councillor Kentner saying that he agrees that we need to potentially get rid of facilities or he disagrees with the outcome of the facility reports that we are using as the guiding documents? Councillor Kentner? I'm not sure. All I, 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 what I'm saying is that, that, uh, that the report talked about the huge funding gaps that just got larger and larger year after year. And I don't think that uh, we would ever be able to sustain the kind of money that, was, that would be called for. So um, in, in a way, I, I'm, I'm thinking I would uh, agree with uh, Darcy, we maybe should just uh, uh, say no to this, uh, this uh, report. I don't, all of the, they're asking for, I don't know how you get that for $60,000, it amazed me. Darcy, I think I'm confused too with that conversation. Um, Councillor Kentner, are you suggesting that because we would not be in a position to uh, pay for the kind of money that is going to be needed for rehabilitation, uh, we do not accept this report? Is that what, is that what I'm that's, understanding? That's sort of what I'm saying. I, like, I, I, uh, I'm not afraid of the, the tough decisions going down the road, uh, what properties we keep and what we dispose of, but I am concerned with our uh, ability to meet the, the kind of funding gaps. Uh, to, to me, the, all of these reports just call for outrageous uh, maintenance levels and, and replacements. And so that, that's, that's why I'm thinking maybe we should just take a pass on this. But I, I'm not sure how you can refute the costs that are proposed by professionals for. Well, that's that that's the, the whole thing. Uh, I mean, uh, I, none of our buildings are falling down. None of them are, are at least uh, there's very few dangerous situations that I'm aware of. And and if you go through uh, the fu the funding gap report, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger every year. But sorry, three three words, Mr. Kent. I believe it was you that applauded the consultant on the transportation master plan yeah. to say that it was nice to finally have a 25 year document that looked at and we have long-term documents that look at 25 years for our facilities and you're saying that you then disagree with those documents i mean I'm, ultimately I'm, like if you if you believe that the costs are so absorbently high then you should have said the exact same thing when we brought forward the Amarok building report, because that's the same consultant that was doing the same number crunching on that report. And then if you felt that the numbers weren't realistic, then it would have been a much easier decision for the Amarok building because it wouldn't have been nearly as costly as what staff brought forward. So I, I really, 
take exception to that, that, you know, two and a half hours ago, you applauded a consultant for doing a 25 year plan. And now you're saying that the 25 year plan that we've got for facilities is bogus. I guess so. I, as far as far as the uh, the uh, uh, transportation master plan, I just applauded the fact that that's the only document we have that looks uh, 25 years into the future and gives us any guidance as to how much growth we're going to see. But I, I find but, but, sir, uh, it's, I, I, it's, I, it's not, sir, though. This plan is 25 years. The wastewater plan is 25 years. The water plan is 25 years. Our bridges actually went out 50 years. So the facilities is 25 years. We have a 10-year plan for our fleet because anything beyond that really doesn't make sense for fleet. We have nothing but long-term plans. I mean, we had a Memorial Park master plan that was 25 years. The members of council scoffed at because they said it was too long. So, sir, I really have to ask you, which is it? Do we have long-term plans or don't we? Or does it just depend on what the monetary value is saying, whether we're comfortable with it or not? I'm sorry if I'm, you know, uh, frustrating you so badly, uh, Mr. Chapman, but at the end of the day, uh, I'm just making the point that I think the funding gaps uh, that are spoken of in that report are unrealistic. Okay, let's move on. Councillor Bartley, you had a question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So Darcy, you're telling me that if we accept this and the consultants go to work and they hand us a document, that that document is gospel. If they say we're going to sell the Bogner Hall, we got to sell the Bogner Hall. We do not have a say in it. Is that where you were coming from? Absolutely not. But I'm, what I was saying was is that the consultant is probably going to bring back a report that provides, in their mind at least, reasonable alternatives to Councillor Kentner's point to reduce that funding gap so that we're not so far in the hole. But in order to do that, it's probably going to be tough decisions. I mean, I just, we continue to bring reports forward to council that have implications of tough decisions. And then council seems to get upset or frustrated that they weren't made aware early enough on, or how did this happen like this? Or, you know, why didn't we have a say in, in how the plan was gonna be developed and who was gonna be consulted with and so on and so forth. So that's why specifically we brought this forward. What you're seeing as a report is 85% of the tender document because we've already drafted the RFP for this. These are the specifications. But we wanted to make it crystal clear to council what it is that we're gonna be asking for because if you're not up for what the potential conclusions are, then there's no point in us doing this. If we're just gonna keep every building, you no matter what, then there's no point in doing this because it's a waste of money. We might as well just take the $60,000 and invest it into a building. Well, if, okay. if that's the way you feel, um, a consultant from outside of the municipality of Meaford will definitely 100% say, you don't need this building, you don't need that, you don't need that, definitely. But as councillors or people that live in the municipality of Meaford, we have to put our heart into it and decide whether we're going to throw everything out the window, out with the, the, the baby with the bathwater, or maintain it. So I have to agree with you. I doubt that I would agree with everything the consultant come forward. And if, uh, if you think as council should agree with everything they, they come forward, then I don't think we should be going ahead with this procedure. Thank you. So Your Worship, I don't believe I, I ever said that council had to agree to any of it. What I'm saying is, is that there'll be conclusions there that council most likely won't like, that somebody from the public won't like, right? There are, there are going to be people, no matter what it is, if there is a conclusion to, to get rid of anything, somebody is not going to like it, okay? So if council is unwilling to make these tough decisions because a very significant minority of the population, like I'm talking maybe 10, 15, 20 people, fill your inbox with hate because of that decision. If council isn't still willing to stick to the guns potentially to reduce the burden on the overall taxpayer to try and get us in line with something that's more affordable, then there is no point in doing this. It would be an exercise of futility because every recommendation would then just not be moved forward with or any recommendation. 
But the, the option to pick and choose from that report still exists once it's finished. That's that's the key. Absolutely. Okay. That, um, that, is not, that is not what you said. You said if we're not going to agree with this document, we might as well not do it. My, my understanding, Councillor Bartley, if I'm mistaken here, please correct me, is that like any consultant's report, these are recommendations coming forward. It is up to us to determine the go or no go for each of the projects that comes forward. So depending on the cost, depending on the uh, there will, uh, uh, you know, the the remuneration costs or uh, alternatives that might be suggested. We still have the opportunity to say we don't agree with that. We're going to keep that one, or we do agree with this one. Have I got that right, Darcy? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So next is uh, Councillor Bell, and then then. Uh, uh, Deputy Mayor and then uh, Councillor Greenfield. Well, thanks, uh, Madam Mayor, and thanks for um, your straight up comments, uh, Mr. Chapman. So when I served on the uh, hall board out at uh, Bogner, and that's now been two years past, there was times when there was conversations at that hall about doing a facility study. Um, so that group uh, is aware that there's a facility study coming. Um, I currently serve with the BIA. They also know that there's a facility study coming. And to them, what's important uh, for discussion is the uh, Midas Mart, the bandstand. Um, and we know that uh, the Woodford Hall is struggling to say the least. And we know that Riverside Hall has got a dedicated group of folks. Um, but it's an absolute financial fact that what we've just done today by hiring more staff is a simple example. We, we have added burdens in some areas and we are gonna to have to alleviate burdens in some other. And I think that there's a lot of people who are aware that there's a facility needs a study gonna take place and that there will be a report coming to council and your comments, Mr. Chapman, about some people not liking it, for sure. And some people who will accept it and understand it, for sure. And for Council Bartley, absolutely we represent the people. And if we were just going to talk about, let's say, Woodford Hall, close to myself, we have to talk about history. We have to talk about community. We have to talk about the heart of the people. We have to talk about all of that. But it's going to break down to the fact that the more and more we pile on, the more and more the expectations will be to raise the taxes in order to accomplish it all. And we have to come to a realization that I've said this before, and I'll quote myself, this municipality has champagne tastes and there's lots of times we have to function on a beer budget. And so I, I, I look forward to this report and you're right. There will be these tough decisions, but I personally didn't go for council to pick the easy stuff. So, um, Mr. Chapman, um, be encouraged. Um, I, I, for one, look forward to this report and there will be things that will be displeasing to myself. And uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, for saying that as these issues come forward, we can address them one at a time. Thank you. Hey, thanks for that, Tony. Uh, Deputy Mayor, you're next. Your Worship, thank you. And uh, I'm also in support of going forward with this report. I think we can't really make decisions without it. Um, I'm wondering, Darcy, two things. First of all, um, obviously recognizing COVID and the fact that these facilities have been shut down, some of them for quite some time now. And, and will it be difficult for the consultant, do you feel, to sort of assess what the usage might be post COVID because you know, things are different now. Their volunteers may not come back into the fold. Um, we just, we don't know what's gonna happen going forward. So I'm wondering how you feel they'll, they'll determine uh, usage 
given the current situation. And I'm also wondering, for argument's sake, if it was determined, Councillor Bell mentioned Woodford Hall, so we'll just use Woodford Hall, for example. If it was determined that that was surplus and we were to sell that, would those funds come back into the pool to help address some of the funding gaps for other facilities? Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, through your worship, I think, you know, the expectation, at least at this stage of the game, would be to advise the consultant when it comes to usage side of things, to look at statistics pre-COVID only, right? And then we'll have to make determinations, uh, you know, a year from now, um, after the report even gets presented to Council, as to what the operating environment is within all, you know, our different facilities at that stage of the game, uh, and see whether things have you know, kind of rebounded back to uh, pre-COVID or not. And if they haven't, that, that might be, you know, a broader discussion outside of just the facility rationalization. Like if community groups aren't meeting anymore and large gatherings aren't happening ever, even if we've got this pandemic under control, then what does that mean for some of our facilities and our operations? So that, that's a question I think outside of the scope uh, of this for sure. With regards to the funding side of things, um, I would say probably uh, I have 95% confidence that what you suggested would be the right course of action, that if we sold a facility, uh, then that money could go back into supporting other facilities. Um, I say that though with 5% uh, reservation simply because if any of the properties that we had were purchased uh, under some kind of a you know, former agreement, or if they were purchased using parkland dedication funds, then that money would have to go back into that funding source. So, um, I mean, I don't know for certain. I, I'm fairly confident that any of the facilities we're looking at, it would probably be a one for one if we got, if we sold it, they could go back into the pot to help offset. But there's the off chance that um, it may have to go into another source. And Councillor Greenfield. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks again, uh, Your Worship. Um, on, unless the Municipal Act changes uh, dramatically in the next few years, it's, uh, it's still going to be up to Council to make the decisions, uh, uh, regardless of, uh, of how the uh, reports come, come forward. But uh, I think, I think we, we need this report. Uh, we need to know uh, uh, the condition of uh, of our buildings and uh, councillors uh, all all have an idea of uh, oh this uh, this building's fine that building's maybe a little suspect but uh, some of them have been on the docket for years uh, the Midas Mart has, has been discussion there uh, Woodford Hall has been a uh, uh, an underproducing facility for years, so they're having questions there. But uh, I, I think we need to go ahead and, and, and get this report. But uh, Mr. Mr. Chapman's correct. Uh, some, one of these days, council is going to have to make some very hard decisions, and uh, they're going to be unpopular decisions, maybe with a few, maybe with many. But uh, that's our job. That's what we're here for. And uh, uh, we'll deal, deal with each and every one uh, as it arises. Thank you. Hey. Much, I can. I know that I, I frustrated uh, Councillor Bartley. Um, <laughs> I can see it on his, on his face right now. So I just, you know, I think maybe the, the way to, that I should have approached this was simply to say that as staff, we've kind of learned a lesson from the past in that you know, the, the bridge study is a good example. Um, you know, had we made it evidently clear to council in 2015, before we released the RFP, that there was a good chance that bridges were going, could, could be closed and that that was going to impact the rural population. I'm not too sure council would have even accepted this moving forward because it wasn't made crystal clear. If we had done a better job of advising council that the end result of a transportation master plan was only going to show that we needed more money to enhance services because we weren't doing the basics in a bunch of areas. I'm not too sure council would have been 
okay with moving forward with the transportation master plan. So I just wanted to make it really clear tonight that if you move forward with this, there is a good opportunity that council is going to have tough decisions to make if they really want to reduce that funding gap. But if we're, if, you know, we really don't want to make those tough decisions and we want to make sure that, that we still are all things to everyone, then it's just easier for us to invest the $60,000 in a facility that we care about. I think, uh, Darcy, if I may follow up with uh, Councillor Greenfield's comments, we haven't been elected to always make easy decisions that are, we are, have been elected to be leaders. We have to look at the welfare of the community all the way through, and that includes making unpopular and uncomfortable decisions at times. Um, it's difficult and it is not easy. Um, and it certainly may discourage many others from running for council if you have to make difficult decisions. But that is the reality and it would be terribly irresponsible of us, of any council, to refuse reports that are going to help make those decisions based on fact and not emotion. Because it's quite easy to succumb to emotion and say, oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll spend the money, we'll make more people um, happy than we'll make them make unhappy. Um, in my way of thinking, that's just totally irresponsible. I think it is imperative that we find factual basis for every decision we make, and that would be one of them. Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I made one of them decisions to date. I know the people don't want us to hire four more staff. I made the decision to hire four more staff. I made that decision. I went against the people. I may go against the people again. But what I don't want to see is a report coming back and the rule, all the little rule things get shut down so that we can afford to keep the ones open in Meaford. Because during budget deliberations, I tried to bring that up and was shut down immensely. Now, what my frustration is, I understand we have a choice to open this or close that, but Mr. Chapman came right out of his lips that if we're not gonna follow the recommendations from the consultants, we might as well save the $60,000 and not do it. And I can bet, I'll give you two to one odds that we're not gonna follow all them recommendations. So why spend the 60 grand? That's where I'm going from. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you, Steve. And, but I also know that we would not necessarily make all of the decisions that are recommend, recommended to, to be made. So it, there may be a saw off there. Any further comments? This, uh, this uh, recommendation is uh, received the report um, for information purposes. So Darcy, the next steps for this then. Uh, through worship, it'll just be, you know, getting this pushed out the door here within the next couple of weeks through our procurement process. And then, um, you know, most likely we'll have something awarded um, with a start for the consultant by September. Okay. And the background, the, the wording in, in, the, in the problem statement has been uh, problematic in the, in the past with, uh, uh, for council to understand what the problem statement um, that the consultant would be required to, um, as, a, as the foundation for their study. That's, I, I guess, what we need to be comfortable with. And that's where they will come into play, whether we may not like all of the recommendations that are made, um, but will we make enough of them that to make it uh, feasible and cost effective? Well, the other option here, Madam Mayor, is I mean, you're like starting at the the very bottom of page two of the report, yeah. and then going through page three. Uh, it yeah. lists all of the facilities that we are going to include in this, right? So, right. I mean, let me explain. We didn't include the library because we just spent you know seven million dollars. There's no point in looking at the library, right? Right. Um, so, but we did take a look at things like even the, the arena and the community center is in there because part of the struggle that we're having is with regards to staffing. 
and, yeah. and use, right? I mean, council already knows that one of the alternatives that we looked at from a facility perspective years ago with the Minna building is not using the small and large hall anymore because they're, they're somewhat underutilized and turning that into office space, right? So we still want the consultant to look at all the facilities that either we have available to the public or that we house staff in so they can start making some, some you know, uh, you know, data-driven uh, recommendations to us as to the staffing side of things. Right. But if you, if there, if there's a, if there's a facility in here, the council is near and dear to you, and you are like, nope, there's no, like, I don't want to see this thing touched. Then you can tell us now. We'll take it out uh, of this list so it doesn't even see the light of day, so that we know that there can't be any negative. Uh, written into a report about it. Okay, anything? Uh, Deputy Mayor. If I was going to pick one, then it would be the cemetery chapel. That's important for people who visit. And Councilor Bell? If I have to pick one for the rural community, I'd have to say that it's Bogner Hall. They more than hold their own, and we have invested recently in the hall. And um, I, I think as a municipality, I think I'd like to continue to put money into that hall and it may well be the last community hall in the rural community. Councillor Kentner. And if I had to pick one, I would pick uh, the band shell on the market square. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I, I know it's also the Midas Mart, but I think of it as, uh, as a performance venue right in the heart of uh, the urban area of Meaford. Um, and I'd just like to go on record, I, I'm not afraid of these uh, difficult decisions either. And I clearly see that down the road, there will be private investors uh, interested in, in some of these assets and that we do need to divest. Uh, we have way too much real estate. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, uh, I, I just was quibbling over the business of uh, the tremendous uh, <laughs> Uh, funding gap that seemed to go up year after year after year and and lead really to uh, you know uh, an unsustainable future so uh, I, I don't know how that happens but anyway I've said my piece thank you Matt. I wonder madam if I, I could leap in for a second because I, I don't want to go too far down the road of just sort of randomly pulling names out of this list because one person's opinion doesn't necessarily mean anything here but I, I, I wanted to grab hold of that comment about the bandstand and the Midas Smart as, as a bit of an example, because to me, that's the one place that we absolutely should not remove from this list. And I'll tell you for why. It's because that building itself is not a well-designed building. It will never be accessible. It, it, is, it has got structural issues and we know we are gonna have to spend quite a lot of money on it. I can absolutely agree with, maybe we need a performance venue outside in Market Square. But going through this process, we'll say, okay, well, we don't need it to be an underground shop and bandstand. We need to get a portable or permanent bandstand rather than just a concrete roof that's not actually a bandstand. It doesn't actually deal with performances very well at all. So I, I, I think that there's, it's not only about open or closed. It's right. about, is there a better way of doing some of these things? Alternatives. Yeah. Alternatives. Thanks for that, Matt. I sure agree that it it doesn't necessarily mean that everything on that list is going to be gone. Do we have any further comments? If not, I will call the question all in favor of uh, receiving this for information purposes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, and that is carried. Thank you very much. Do we need another break, guys? Are we going to? We're almost done. Can we hang on?
Okay. Um, COR 2021-33 is the award for provision of engineering support services. Um, recommendation that the municipality of Meaford enact a bylaw to appoint a roster of engineering for, firms for the period of July 1, 2021 to June 30th, 2026. And a mover and a seconder, please put that on the table. Councilor Bartley. And uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Okay, any comments, questions? Um, <clears throat> So, Councillor Vickers? No? Okay. Anybody else have any comments? Seeing none. Then I will call a question all in favor of receiving this report and acting the bylaws suggested, and that is carried. Thank you. Let's move on quickly then to uh, updates from members. First one is uh, County Council. Over to you, Deputy Mayor, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, County Council met on May 27th. Council discussed and passed a bylaw 5112 21 with a recorded vote. All lower tiers except for the Town of Blue Mountains are in favor of this bylaw, which provides the ability to proceed with the cancelization of tax increases for the purpose of relieving financial hardship. The members from the Town of Blue Mountains questioned the apportionment of the tax relief. County Treasurer Mary Lou Spicer explained that the apportionment is dictated by the province. That's a bit of a complicated issue, so I won't uh, try to expand on it any further unless you wish to, Your Worship. We also heard from Wesley Wilson, who was here with us today with his recommendations for barn preservation. It was suggested at County Council that Mr. Wilson uh, also present to the Gray County Agricultural Committee, which I'm a member of, where recommendations will be prepared um, and submitted back to a County Council to consider. Russ Pearson and Kevin Lynn delivered an exceptionally well-prepared presentation requesting the lowering of the speed limit on County Road 17B in Georgian Bluffs. Considerable discussion ensued about the merits of supporting this request. Other dangerous circumstances on this road and and the fact that algorithms from GPS devices are probably sending truck traffic along this route to Highway 6 and 21. This is causing accidents and creating pedestrian safety issues for the residents of 17B. It has been verified by the OPP that over 50% of the traffic on this road are speeding. County Council has requested a staff report outlining recommendations for next steps to lower the speed limit and to address other identified concerns on this road. It was also well noted that speeding is a major problem across the entire county. Uh, there will be a report to County Council on this in uh, July. Nadia DeSanti presented on behalf of WSP Consulting with an overview of an age-friendly community strategy and action plan for Gray County. This is funded through a $60,000 grant. It's important to note that this plan is designed to support all ages of residents, not just seniors. An age-friendly community encourages active aging by optimizing opportunities for health, participation, and security in order to enhance the quality of life as we age. And that's a quote from the report. There will be many opportunities for collaborative engagement over the next few months, which will be primarily virtual in nature, focus routes and surveys, for examples. Council approved some time ago funding for the purchase of land in Gray Highlands for a new transportation depot. It has since been brought to the attention of County Council and staff that the property in question is adjacent to the historic Old Durham Road Black Pioneer Cemetery. The cemetery committee and county staff are now engaged in conversations as to how to proceed. Um, we're grateful for the thoughtful and understanding engagement of this group. And you may have heard about that um, on the news. So that was it for me, Your Worship, unless you wish to uh, add to anything. No, that's a very good report. Thanks, uh, as usual, Deputy Mayor. Okay, we'll move on to the Parks Advisory Committee. Who's going to do that? <laughs> Councilor Greenfield. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. And I'm, I'm sure Councilor Bartley wants to get in on this. Um, actually, I think we've been uh, you know, thinking primarily about the uh, 
the upcoming meeting uh, for Wednesday afternoon, but uh, at our last meeting, I, I think the, uh, the Parks Advisory Committee finalized its, its final comments concerning the Memorial Park Master Plan. And we also had uh, quite a bit of discussion about the, uh, the Toboggan Hill up on the uh, Center Street uh, property. And uh, I, I came away with the opinion that uh, all the committee members thought it would be a great asset. Um, but uh, then again, there's, uh, there's a financial responsibility and uh, 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 a number of other things to discuss. Uh, on, on Wednesday meetings, uh, Steve, am I correct? St. Vincent Park is the, uh, uh, the, the main uh, focus of, uh, of our attention. And uh, that's all I can think of. You go ahead. Well, I don't have much to say, but we did, uh, we did spend more time on the Memorial Park. The Burnside report says that the uh, they wanted to take the camping away from the shoreline and uh, Darcy and, and Rod Willis, because they shortened up the shoreline, trailers really don't fit in there. So the public wants some of that shoreline back and we came to an agreement that we were gonna lose some of the campsites because there isn't room and Councillor Greenfield come up with another addendum to that, which saved us six more campsites. So. It will come to council in a report. I think we've come to a very good compromise on it. Thank you. Good job. Okay, BIA is uh, Councilor Bell. Well, Madam Mayor and fellow councilors, uh, I don't, uh, I don't have a report for the BIA. Uh, something happened uh, in my life at about seven thirty on the morning of uh, of the BIA meeting. And uh, I wasn't even inside the municipality and it didn't leave me any time, Madam Mayor, to call a fellow member of council to uh, cover for myself. So unless you joined the meeting, uh, you may have something to say as you're, you're generally pretty good at covering meetings. So uh, I'm going to have to say that my report is uh, this time I have no report. You have no report. You report that you have no report. And unfortunately, I missed it as well. Um, for other reasons, as uh, that was an, an early morning. That's usually a morning uh, time when I can join in virtually, but no, I missed it as well. So we'll skip that and pick you up later next month. Thanks. Uh, are there any other boards or any other announcements from folks? Councilor Greenfield. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Grace Albo uh, did meet last uh, last Wednesday uh, virtually again. A um, couple of things. Uh, Baker Tilly uh, did uh, present our uh, our audit uh, for last year, and uh, I think overall, overall concerning the year we had, uh, everything seemed to be reasonable. It was still. There's still a lot of concerns about the changes to the Conservation Act, and uh, uh, and they are ongoing. And uh, at three twelve, both Councillor Vickers and I had to suddenly leave the meeting uh, due to a power failure. So I uh, uh, really not uh, uh, not aware of just uh, what else transpired. Okay, Paul, anything to add? That. No. Okay, Deputy Mayor. Your Worship, thank you. I was just going to uh, remind everyone that on the 9th of June, we have our second uh, Economic Development uh, Advisory Committee meeting and we'll be discussing our goals for this committee. So just to encourage anyone who's able to, uh, to tune in, this will be a good meeting. Okay, thanks for that. I just have two quick ones. Um, the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan met on uh, last week, May 27th, and uh, we had another look at the task uh, action items that uh, Hannah has been putting together and uh, approved the action items list to submit to as a recommendation to Council. So we will be seeing that as the next step. Uh, she's also finalizing the content for the draft plan and uh, 
uh, obviously that will come to council for consideration as well. Um, the other thing I just wanted to do a quick update was on the last um, joint municipal uh, physician recruitment and retention committee, um, there was a discussion on the, just an update, brief update on the survey results. Um, and I don't know how it shakes out for other communities because I've just got the information for, um, uh, for the Meaford area. But there were about roughly 1,300 responses uh, to the survey total from all five um, municipalities. And uh, uh, 250 of them came from the municipality of Meaford. But 85% of those of that number have a doctor. Um, it may not be locally. In fact, only 36% um, uh, of that number were uh, have doctors within the municipality of Meaford. So uh, there's a large number of that number uh, of the who have physicians, those physicians are outside of the municipality of Meaford. Thought that was a very interesting thing. We did not, we're not able to capture, um, as the deputy mayor had indicated earlier, uh, what an actual count for our um, orphan patients are within our municipality. More on that as, uh, as we, we move along. Um, the building report is next. Might that be you, Mr. Greenfield? Thank you, uh, uh, Mayor Compass. It is a pleasure. This is a report that I was planning on um, going on and on for about 20 minutes, but I uh, changed my plans uh, since it is 6.15. Uh, it's an amazing report, a wonderful report, one of the very best that we've ever had, over $26.5 million worth of permits already sold by the end of April, uh, new homes up, uh, renovations up, multi-residential up, uh, agricultural uh, up. So it's it's, uh, it's an amazing report. We're uh, uh, we're heading for a record. Uh, maybe won't get up to the the new school uh, year, but uh, we got a pretty good start, and uh, I, I hope it can keep going. We just need to get this pandemic behind us, and uh, the sky's the limit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Air <laughs> Councillor Greenfield. Okay, um, accompanying that is a variance report. And uh, is there any comments that uh, Council wish to make on that? Work, I believe Margaret has pulled that together for us. Seeing none, um, I will ask for a recommendation, the recommendation that we receive the uh, regular statistical memo memos for information purposes. All in favor? And that is carried. Can I have a motion to move out of committee of the whole, please? Councillor Bartley, Councillor Bell, thank you. All in favor? And are there any uh, notices of motion to come forward? I think uh, Shirley, you were going to bring one and Harley, okay. Shirley, we'll hear yours first, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And uh, yeah, I don't have all my thoughts together, but as we suggested, a notice of motion um, to be passed at this council and taken to county to request uh, the uh, $370,000 uh, portion of the PLT that would go to the county, remain here in the municipality of Meaford. And I'm thinking because our number one priority at the county currently is affordable housing that we tie it to uh, housing in some capacity. So I will look to Matt for his uh, help and support and guidance in that. Okay. Great, thank you. Councillor Greenfield? Uh, yes, um, I do need to talk to Mr. Smith and uh, Director Victoria about this, but I uh, am uh, very concerned about Miller Street Hill and I am uh, thinking about bringing forward a notice of motion that would restrict the size and the weight of vehicles on Miller Street. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Kentner? Uh, thank you through your worship. Uh, I just, uh, uh, we have talked before about the uh, 988 uh, three digit uh, uh, suicide crisis line. And uh, I would like to uh, serve notice that I'll have that motion ready for our next meeting. Okay, super, thank you. 
Um, so we'll um, move on to the... Sorry, uh, Madam Mayor, can I just leap in there? Uh, I believe that motion is on the correspondence list, so Council can cast that motion today when we get to it on, in the communication section. It is, and I wondered whether that was appropriate enough that we can just pull it from the communication and pass it as we move along. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Terrific, we'll do it that way then. If Okay, can we have a mover and a seconder, please, to put the minutes of the council meeting of May the 10th on the table? Councilor Greenfield, Councilor Kentner, thank you. Um, any comments on that? Then all, of, all in favor? And that is carried. Um, and the closed meeting of May the 10th, uh, mover and a seconder, please, to put that on the table. Councillor Vickers, Councillor Bartley, and all in favor? And it is carried. So on the uh, communications, are, are there, is there anything that uh, we need to hold for discussion? I, Councillor Kentner. On the, uh, I, I just wanted to, to uh, draw your attention, uh, or the attention of council to the uh, letter from, uh, um, which one was it now here? Uh, a, a resident in the uh, town of Blue Mountains, uh, Mrs. Holm, who uh, was pointing out uh, the plan to uh, widen the Georgian Trail to 12 feet. Mm -hmm. um, I just would like to know more about that. Uh, I don't know who, who does know more but I certainly uh, found her letter uh, quite um, concerning. Yes, as did I. I had made a note of that as well. Thank you. Um, we, are, we don't ha have a representative on that anymore. Maybe uh, Matt or Darcy, do you know something about that now? Uh, yes, Sri Worship. So th yeah, there is no representative from a board. The three municipalities look after their own areas. Um, there is a club uh, um, that has funds available that they wanted to provide to the three municipalities in order to do some trail maintenance and trail widening at very specific locations where some uh, overgrowth and washouts had happened. So each of the three municipalities is looking into that. I don't know the specifics of the location or if this uh, letter is specific to that work that's just planning on being done, but uh, that's about the best that I can provide. Uh, and if it is in Town Blue Mountains uh, area, then it's not actually something that we can control. That we have anything to do with anyway. Yeah. I think- well, Thank I, you for that, appreciate it. I, I think the plan is to widen the trail wherever it is not 12 feet in width, which will involve uh, removal of trees and, and uh, other changes. So I, I just think we should look into it and uh, make sure that uh, you know, we have uh, some input if we feel it's necessary. So through your worship, it's not actually to widen the trail itself. It's to widen out the trail and the, the tree and the foliage and everything back to a 12 feet wide area, specifically when you're going around some of the corners and bends and everything, because it's a multi-use trail. Some people are walking very slow with their dog or a small kid. Other people are racing down it, you know, at 25 kilometers an hour on a on a bike, right? So it's just, it is about trimming back some of the trees that have grown in, uh, but it's the, the, the platform of the trail itself is not going to be any wider than uh, generally than it currently is right now. But it's just to create better sight. Okay, thank you for that, Darcy. And um, on the correspondence list, I think it was page 27 of 111, was the three-digit uh, three crisis um, number motion. It, if you wanted to um, pull that, Councillor Kentner. Matt, did you have? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, I was just there and I was just going to read the motion so that all of Council knew what we were talking about and anybody who's still watching uh, also knew. Um, okay. So the proposed motion that, that the MP Alex Ruff heard sent to the municipality reads as follows. Whereas the federal government has passed a motion to adopt 988, a national three-digit suicide and crisis hotline, and whereas the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has increased the demand for suicide prevention services by 200%, 
And whereas existing suicide prevention hotlines require the user to remember a 10 digit number and go through directories or be placed on hold. And whereas in 2022, the United States will have in place a national 988 crisis hotline. And whereas the municipality of Meaford recognizes that it is a significant and important initiative to ensure critical barriers are removed to those in a crisis and seeking help. Uh, now, therefore, it be resolved that the municipality of Meaford endorses this 988 crisis line initiative and that staff be directed to send a letter indicating such support to the local MP, MPP, Federal Minister of Health, the CRTC and local area municipalities to indicate our support. Thank you, Matt. Um, so do we need a mover and a seconder to pull that? Uh, uh, yes, forward? absolutely. Uh, Mr. Uh, Councillor Kentner, will you I do would that? Be happy to move it. Thank you. Thank you. And a seconder, please. Okay, Councillor Bell. Um, all in favor of this motion coming forward? And that is carried. Thank you for that. Anything else in the correspondence list that needed attention? Okay, seeing none, I will move into the confirming bylaw. I need a mover and a seconder to put on, uh, put this on the table. Thank you, Councillor Bartley, Councillor Greenfield. Be it resolved that bylaw 2021-46 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Municipality of Meaford at its regular and special meetings held in the month of May 2021 be taken as read a first, second, and third time and finally passed. All in favor? That is carried. And that brings us to the conclusion of a very long and interesting agenda. Thank you all for your participation, your comments, your very thoughtful participation. Appreciate it all. And with that, I will declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.